Okay, live stream is up. One second. Okay, now sergeants, will you start your recordings? PC recording is started. Cloud is up. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Pulowski, you may start with opening. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today before the Council's Committee on Parks and Rec Recreation. I would like to acknowledge my fellow Council members who are present, Council Member Brandon, Council Member uh, uh, Dharma Diaz, Council Member Joe Nye, Council Member Wiley, Council Member Rivera, Council Member Ren Bremer, uh, Council Member Holden, and a few others may be joined later. Yeah. Good morning and welcome to the Parks and Recreation Committee a hearing on the fiscal, fiscal 2022 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2021 preliminary mayor's management report for the Department of Parks and Recreation. My name is Peter Ku. I'm the chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee. Today, we will hear testimony from the Department of Parks and Recreation on its expense and capital budgets for fiscal 2022. The department's proposed fiscal 2022 expense budget totals $532.7 million. This is $29.6 million higher than the fiscal 2021 adopted budget. In total, the proposed fiscal 2022 expense budget represents a little more than half of 1% of the entire proposed city budget of $92.3 billion. The department's proposed capital budget for fiscal 2022 through 2025 totals $2.9 billion, which represents approximately 5.4% of the city's total capital budget for 2022 to 2025. It has been exactly a year since our last preliminary budget hearing and exactly a year since the council's last in-person hearing. We adopted the fiscal 2021 budget in the middle of a pandemic that has ravaged our city and has permanently changed our way of life. Even at this moment, we are still not sure if or when we can get together in the same room without worrying about social, distance, social distancing. As a result of the pandemic, we have witnessed dramatic increases in usage of our parks and the number of visitors at our parks. These increases have required the parks department and its volunteers to intensify efforts to maintain our city's parks. Unfortunately, these increases are also helping. Unfortunately, these increases are also happening despite the fact that the department's fiscal 2021 adopted budget was significantly reduced by the COVID-19 related budget cuts. The main result of this cuts was the loss of almost 
2,000 seasonal maintenance and operation workers. The loss of workers quickly contributing to the growing sanitation and maintenance problems across the New York City's green spaces. We saw on mow lawns, trash piles, and cordon off spaces across our park system. As we begin the fiscal 2022 budget process, we must keep in mind that in the fiscal 2021 adopted budget, the administration did not include $25 million for our parks, despite the urging of the council. Last year, the council successfully negotiated with the administration for the inclusion of $10 million to save the jobs of 150 maintenance workers in the fiscal 2021 adopted budget. However, this funding was not baseline and therefore not included in the fiscal 2022 preliminary, preliminary budget plan. In addition, despite all the challenging factors, the council continued its investment in parks with an allocation of $1.8 million for the past equity initiative in fiscal 2021. However, the initiative saw a 65% cut compared to the fiscal 2020 adopted budget allocation. Although it is understandable that the current budget priorities are heavily focused on combating the pandemic, we must not forget that parks are critical infrastructure that are essential to our city's recovery efforts. During the past year, our parks provided a break from the Queen New York City apartments, where a place to enjoy a walk and safely visit friends and families. And they will continue to be essential to keep our residents physical and mental health in balance. As the Poach wrote, quote, NYC parks have become people's everything, unquote. As we head into the warmer weather, we must remember that during long pandemic times, parks are the key to healthy communities. Our city's resiliency and fight against climate climate change and are drivers of econo economic growth. Investing in our parks is investing in our residents and our city's recovery. Thank you to my committee staff, especially Monica and Chima of the financial division, Chris and Patrick of the legislative division and my own staff. We will now hear from the Commissioner Silver of Parks and Re Recreation. But before we hear the Commissioner, uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues who are present. Uh, I always acknowledge them. Are there any more? Later on, I will allow, uh, acknowledge, acknowledge them more. And now with the committee council, please swear in the commissioner and his team. Thank you, Chair Ku. I'm Chris Sartori, senior counsel to the committee on parks and recreation and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration yeah. or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom hand raised function and I'll call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. 
For members of the public, we will be limiting speaking time to two minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you are called on to testify, please begin by stating your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing for the Department of Park Creation, Department of Parks and Rec Recreation will be Mitchell Silver, Dep Commissioner of the Department, Liam Cavanaugh, First Deputy Commissioner, Therese Braddock, Deputy Commissioner for Capital Projects, Margaret Nelson, Deputy Commissioner, Urban Park Service and Public Programs, Joy Wang, Deputy Commissioner for Administration, David Stark, Assistant Commissioner for Budget and Fiscal Management, Sam Biederman, Assistant Commissioner for Community Outreach and Partnership Development, and Matt Jury, Director of Government Relations. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I will call on you individually for a response. So at this time, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth for this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Silver. I do. First Deputy Commissioner Capital. Yes. Deputy Commissioner Nelson. I do. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Wang. I'm, I'm not video. Uh, so. Commissioner Wang. Commissioner Wang doesn't. I do. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Stark. I do. Assistant, Can you hear me now? I, I do. Yes, we hear you. Okay. Yes. Assistant Commissioner Biederman. I do. Uh, Commissioner Braddock. I do. And Braddock. Director Jury. Is Director Jury there? We might have a. Let me see him. Just give us one second with the muting. You can say it from my speaker. I do. Okay. Great. Thank you. So at this time, I will invite Commissioner Mitchell Silver to please present his testimony. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Ku, members of the Parks Committee and other members of the Council. I'm Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, and I'm joined virtually here today by a number of my senior staff. As you're aware, New York City Parks' primary responsibility is the stewardship of over 30,000 acres of green and open space encompassing 5,000 individual properties, ranging from playgrounds and beaches to community gardens and natural areas. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to discuss the agency's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2022, and to provide an overview of our agency's recent efforts and initiatives in building and maintaining our agency's green and open spaces during a year that was incredibly difficult and challenging for the agency and for all New Yorkers. In fact, it was almost precisely a year ago today that I appeared before this committee in council chambers to discuss last year's preliminary budget. In what came to be the last in-person hearing held by the city council uh, before the COVID lockdown. As I testified at the time, we were aware of the impending concerns and working closely with the Department of Health and to prepare for potential pandemic but no one could have imagined how transformative 2020 would prove to be in ways both horrifying as well as uplifting. We truly live in a completely different world than we did a year ago. Through the terrible toll of lives lost and families shattered during COVID, the pain of the resulting economic crisis and the long overdue dialogue on systematic racism sparked by the Black Lives Matter movement and the tragic deaths of George Floyd and countless other black men and women. Through it all, one dynamic has remained constant and increasingly clear. Our city parks and open spaces are critical infrastructure that is absolutely vital to New Yorkers. We've always prided ourselves on being the agency of fun, health, and happiness. But we learned even more that this past year 
just how much parks play a central role in improving the well being of the city's residents. Anyone visiting one of our parks during the last 12 months could see how our city's residents came to rely on these sanctuaries of sanity for all of the physical, mental, and emotional benefits they provide, especially as alternatives for relaxation and recreation became increasingly rare. Travel to the other parts of the country was practically impossible. Concert halls, movie theaters shuttered, and the lights on Broadway sadly remained dark. But our city's parks stayed open and available to New Yorkers in their greatest hour of need. We all owe a huge debt of gratitude to our parks employees, especially our frontline employees in the field who've worked extraordinarily hard in a very challenging environment to keep our properties safe and to preserve exceptional amenities that people have come to expect from our park system. The pandemic brought about the need for many difficult decisions as COVID-19 continued to spread and our understanding of the disease itself and its impact on the city's fiscal position continued to evolve. Working in coordination with other city entities, we had to close our recreation centers and some of our smallest parks and playgrounds, cancel permits for athletic sports and large public programs, and pause our capital reconstruction projects. But our agency remained strong and resilient, and we creatively reassigned staff and repurposed several of our properties as part of the city's response to this crisis. Our parks enforcement patrol officers and urban park rangers help ensure that park goers could relax and enjoy our open spaces in a safe manner. And the creation of our parks social distance ambassadors program made possible largely through the redeployment of our public program staff was key to keeping park visitors safe. I am proud to note that our agency staff through a variety of efforts and initiatives distributed close to 8 million face coverings to the public, free of cost. Several of our recreation centers became food distribution sites, delivering over 42 million meals to our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Central Park and Flushing Meadows Corona Park were sites of temporary emergency field hospitals, providing more capacity for the healthcare system that was heavily taxed in the early weeks of the pandemic. And COVID testing sites have been established at five parks recreation centers. Our Brooklyn Borough Operations staff even took the initiative and created six foot red signs to help remind park goers to maintain a social distance, which became an iconic emblem modeled all over the globe. But our participation in the city's effort to slow the spread of COVID did not prevent us from focusing on our core mission. And as our work continued to maintain and care for our parks and provide recreational opportunities, both virtually and in the field. For those who were not able to go out into our parks, even for a brief visit, we created Parks at Home, which featured virtual content on our website and social platforms, serving the young and the young at heart, including live park tours, meditation, fitness clinics, art classes, and other fun activities, including New York City Park's very own Spotify channel, where we were able to celebrate the connection between green spaces and music with several specially curated playlists. Out in our parks, we continue to maximize our resources and work smarter to provide the amenities and level of service that New Yorkers have come to expect. In the summer and fall, our public programs and recreation uh, division teams, including the urban park rangers, offered a diverse variety of close to 2,000 socially distant outdoor programs, including nature, education, arts, photography, media education, crafts, fitness, and sports. A vast majority were offered in 27 neighborhoods identified by the city's COVID racial inclusion and equity task force. Our arts and antiquities division was able to repair and clean close to 600 monuments and offer 48 temporary art exhibitions for the public to enjoy throughout the city. Our partnership with Parks Division, a joint effort with the City Parks Foundation, coordinated the participation of 7,000 volunteers in hundreds of safety organized service projects, many at the COVID relief priority sites. 
To keep our local community gardens healthy and thriving during COVID, our Green Thumb distributed uh, about uh, 1,000, I'm sorry, 110,000 free plants and over 2,000 cubic yards of free topsoil to our community garden groups and facilitated garden, garden renovations and the construction of new raised planting beds for these unique and beloved community sites. Though we were only able to open a portion of our outdoor pools last summer due to safety concerns, our marketing and operations team worked closely together to add two new of our creative and fun Cool Pools NYC initiative, which has transformed several of our outdoor pools in underserved neighborhoods and to revitalize resort quality destinations that are more vibrant and welcoming. Our natural resource group in collaboration with the Natural Areas Conservancy completed and published our wetlands management framework and delivered long awaited improvement and restoration projects, including the Putnam Greenway in Van Cortlandt Park. And as soon as we were authorized to bring our capital projects back online, our capital division continued to get results, completing long awaited projects such as the, be the beautiful renovation of Luther Gulick Park in Manhattan, our Parks Without Borders project at Prospect Park in Brooklyn, which created a new entrance for the community on the eastern edge of the park, and phase one of our Anchor Parks project in St. Mary's Park in the Bronx, helping make an old park new again. All of this was possible because we prioritized safety and the well-being of our incredible parks employees. Throughout the COVID-19 crisis, we have provided our staff with a variety of resources so they can tend to their work in a safe manner. In addition to following the city and state health directives, we provided the necessary personal protective equipment, implemented flexible and staggered scheduling for essential workers, adapted our vehicle policy to promote social distancing, introduced robust cleaning protocol for our facilities and continue to provide a steady stream of up-to-date information for all employees who broadcast emails regarding COVID testing and other resources to benefit their physical and mental well-being. In May of 2020, we led an effort to publicize Going Green for Parkies, a global effort to thank our park workers as iconic buildings across the country and the world were lit green in tribute to essential park workers. This tribute at the Empire State Building, Washington Square Arch, and other buildings across the city, country, and world served as an incredible acknowledgement and thanks for all of their hard work. And of course, we're keeping our employees informed about the important COVID vaccinations and working very closely with health authorities as state and local guidance evolves and more and more of our employees become eligible for the vaccine. Alongside the emergence of COVID pandemic, the economic crisis our society is dealing with, a fundamental crisis of conscience, as a nation faces a reckoning with centuries of institutional racism, inequity, and hatred. Our city parks were major locations for Black Lives Matter protests, other free speech gathering, gatherings, and we as an agency also contending with these dynamics head on. Our public facing efforts included the creation of Juneteenth Grove in Cabin Plaza and renamings of several park properties for prominent persons in the black community. Though we have long prided ourselves on a record of MWB inclusion and engagement, we are redoubling our efforts to create even more business opportunities for MWBE firms to reflect and honor the diversity of our city. In light of these fundamental challenges, we also have to take a look inward as an agency. And I was proud to elevate our equal opportunity officer position to an assistant commissioner level back in 2015, the first New York City agency to do so, to ensure that our dedication to equity and fairness includes our internal hiring and promotion practices. During the summer, we launched Reflections On, an internal agency forum encouraging open discourse and candid dialogue about racial and social issues impacting many parkies. Since its exception, we have successfully engaged in meaningful and poignant staff discussions in an effort to sustain a safer, inclusive, and equitable work environment. In the spirit of hopefulness and unity, we look toward to 2021 as a city 
nation and world slowly heals and recovers from this crisis. In accordance with state and city guidance, we are increasingly able to permit organized league sports and special events. All park capital projects that have been temporarily placed on hold have been granted permission to officially move forward. Given the large volume of projects that are coming back online, we are carefully strategizing how to proceed to avoid overwhelming oversight agencies, flooding the construction market, and affecting our active portfolio. Many of you recall that parks faced an incredibly difficult staffing situation last spring and summer in light of the city's fiscal challenges, including a suspension of our seasonal staffing plan. We do expect to have an increase in seasonal staffing and other resources compared to last year but this upcoming season will still be challenging, warmer weather, lower rates of COVID spread, and increased public confidence in vaccines will lead to even more people leaving their homes and seeking to return to normalcy. Since many other aspects of life around the city will be phased in slowly, including our recreational outlets, we expect parks usage will again surge greatly in the upcoming months leading to a similar litter and maintenance challenges as last year. Our incredible staff will work their hardest, but our resources are finite. So we need all New Yorkers to step up and do their part to keep our shared public spaces in the best condition possible. We will be relaunching the anti-litter public education campaign we successfully executed last summer. And we hope the council will join us in educating New Yorkers as well as recruiting volunteers to help on our Monday morning pitch-ins and serve as litter ambassadors as targeted sites during, at targeted sites during the periods of peak usage. Turning to specific topic of this hearing, this year's preliminary budget remains relatively cautious in light of the ongoing economic impacts faced by the city. However, it still gives our agency the resources we need to continue getting the job done. The agency's expense budget includes $532.7 million in mayoral funding this year for operational needs, a significant increase over last year's adopted budget. The preliminary 10-year capital plan, including the current fiscal year, provides a total capital budget of $5.67 billion, reflecting the importance of keeping our portfolio in a state of good repair. Last year, has been a difficult one for all of us. And I'm extremely proud of the work we've done and grateful for the solace and comfort that parks have provided New Yorkers in the face of so much pain and loss. When New Yorkers needed room to breathe, literally and figuratively for their physical, mental, and emotional well-being, our parks were there for them, providing Frederick Law Umstead's belief that parks truly are the lungs of the city. That is why I'm exceptionally honored when the American Planning Association awarded its 2020 National Planning Excellence Award for Advancing Diversity and Social Change to the agency for its Community Parks Initiative. And when the World Urban Parks Organization also honored New York City Park System with the 2020 Legacy Award. Though I expect to appear before council at least one more time, I want to thank you for the council support of great parks and open spaces for all New Yorkers during my tenure. I also want to thank Mayor de Blasio for granting me the privilege to transform this agency and our park system for making them more equitable, inclusive, and resilient. I am grateful to have worked with the amazing New York City Parks leadership, as well as the dedicated park staff. Who helped keep our parks safe, clean, and accessible especially through a global pandemic. Serving Parks Commissioner has been the highest honor of my career. New York City Parks looks forward to continuing to work alongside the City Council to create a bright green future with more equitable and inclusive park system. We are now happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now turn it over to Chair Ku for his questions. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Commissioner, for the testimony. Yeah. And I want to thank you on, on behalf of the, the, the past committee 
Uh, thank you for your outstanding service to the citizens of New York. Um, I have some questions. The fiscal 2021 adopted budget cuts that came into effect on July 1st, 2020, significantly affected parks operation. As a result of the cuts, 1,700 seasonal staff were low higher and maintenance hours reduced by roughly 25,000 hours per week. The cumulative effect was increased in the number of 311 park sanitation, sanitation complaints and lack of evening hours or VN coverage despite the incredible increase in park usage, especially in the evenings and weekends. The pandemic is not yet over and the council is highly concerned about the condition of our parks in the nearest future. So commissioner, the pandemic is not over yet. And you know, the council is really concerned about the condition of our parks, both now and in the future. So I must ask you, will the department have sufficient maintenance workers for this coming spring season to ensure a safe and clean environment for all parks? Council Member Koo, thank you for your question. Uh, the answer is yes. If you recall, uh, when we were in an economic crisis uh, last year, uh, there a lot of the one shots were cut. Uh, we did not, we were not able to advance our seasonal plan. And your statement is correct. In fact, it was over 32,000 hours uh, of working in parks that we lost each week. So it was quite significant. The good news is the seasonal plan has now been restored. Uh, for this year, fiscal year 2021. And so we're able to start hiring uh, and prepare both our fields and our pools, which is what we normally use them for. Uh, but we still know ramping up will take some time. And that is why we wanna thank all the volunteers that have helped last year. Uh, we had somewhat of the perfect storm. Uh, we had fewer staff, 1700, but then more people were using our park. Uh, they became uh, someone's office, their outdoor gym, a stage. And so we saw people come into parks at the same time, it was a struggle for staff to keep up. So I can tell you uh, those were uh, one year, not one shot, I'm sorry, cuts, but a one year cut of FY 2022 looks so much better. Uh, but in terms of 2021 this spring, uh, we're now hiring those seasonals so that people will be ready and prepared, supplemented with a litter campaign and support from all of our volunteers. Thank you. So uh, the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget does not include the one-time funding for, of $10 million successfully negotiated by the city council in the fiscal 2021 adopted budget. Has there been any discussion with OMB of adding the $10 million into the past budget in the executive budget for fiscal 2022? Thank you for the question, council member. Uh, as you know, this is the preliminary budget and we have several months before we move into the adopted. Uh, I know uh, it is both important to the department, it's important to the council, important to the public. And I do anticipate as the budget process continues, uh, this will be one item that will be heavily discussed. Uh, so I know how, uh, how difficult it was last year. We knew that we would not be able to uh, fund that, uh, that one shot uh, budget item. And I'm confident it will be part of our conversation this year. And I look forward to engaging the council with OMB and the mayor's office as we move toward uh, the adopted budget. So can you explain to the committee what will be the impact on parks uh, maintenance if the administration does not restore this funding, which pays for 150 workers? Uh, council member, we always find a way to get the job done. Uh, it was a very difficult year last year uh, and we uh, made sure we found a way of cleaning up the parks to the best of our ability. I have to thank all the New Yorkers and the volunteers who stepped up, uh, but even with limited resources, we found a way to keep the parks clean. 
We couldn't cut the grass as often as we'd like to. Uh, we couldn't even uh, collect the trash as much as we'd like to. But we came up with our litter campaign where people can dispose of their trash in corrals. Uh, and so a lot of that helped. Uh, we'll see how the budget unfolds and we'll sit down and be creative to figure out ways we can continue to give New Yorkers the very best park experience. Uh, as you know, I'd always want to see more staff to help our parks and our gardens. Uh, but we also have to deal with the budget reality and the budget we're handed to, uh, the leadership team will figure out how do we find a way of maintaining our parks to a quality that New Yorkers find acceptable. Thank you. So given the current sanitary condition of our parks, would you consider the loss of this funding acceptable? Again, uh, if you look at our parks today, uh, we still maintain quality parks. Uh, it may have taken us a few days uh, to address uh, some of the litter conditions, uh, but I'm confident that with the staff we have, we can still maintain a clean and safe park system. All, more staff is always helpful, but we've learned over the past, at least I have seven years, uh, that we have to work with the budget we have. If given more, I can do more, but if given less, we have to be smarter and more innovative to ensure we maintain our park system in a quality that the public expects. Okay. Uh, before I ask any, any questions, I want to say that we are also joined by Council Member Gennaro. The fiscal 2022 preliminary budget savings plan include one time $15 million savings in fiscal 2021 to Parks Opportunity, Opportunity Program, POP, which is funded by NYC Human Resources Department and administered by Parks Department. What is the current number of participants enrolled in this program? Uh, just let me defer that to uh, Assistant Commissioner David Stark or Joy Wang. Let's go to yeah. David Stark. Uh, yeah. Hi, hi, everybody. So we have uh, 1,080 POPs right now. The savings that came out of our budget are all reflected in the earlier part of the year when we weren't able to hire people. And we expect to not hit the numbers that were at the high in the last two years, but come up, we'll have around 1,300 POPs by April and hopefully, hopefully get close to 2000 by July. So we are hiring right now. OMB has approved the hires and HRA is working with our staff to bring in people. And it's a, a great job here. We have a lot of POPs that we find full-time employment at NYCHA with benefits when they've been with us for over a year. And we've been able to extend the POPs that were here for over six months. So no one was losing their job while we weren't able to hire new POPs. And, uh, uh, looking better than before. Thank you. So can you help us in the committee to understand the importance of these workers to pass maintenance? They're vitally important. A uh, huge percentage of our maintenance staff, uh, in some cases, are, are POP workers. Uh, we value them as part of our family. So you may, if you did not know a few years ago, I changed their uniforms to make sure they look like they're part of the Parks Department because they are. We revamped the orientation to communicate that they are welcome to the Parks Department. And then we work hard to find them full-time employment, either in parks, with NYCHA, or the private sector. They play a vital role, and you see them out there all the time. And so uh, there is a high school, well, used to be a equivalency graduation every year, something I would not miss because of the pride we have uh, in these workers. Uh, we want to see them grow. We want to see them move into employment. And so we're very proud of this agency that we uh, employ more pop than any other agency by far in New York City. So it is a vital program to us at the agency. They provide a vital resource to New Yorkers by cleaning and maintaining their parks. So it's a critically important program and I'm proud uh, to be uh, the agency that are able to work uh, with our pop workers. Thank you. So what was the P pandemic level of funding for POP? And what is the level of funding included in the budget for fiscal 2022? Right. Let me defer that question back to uh, Commissioner Stark. Hmm. 
In, in fiscal 22, we have the full budget and we'll be hiring uh, uh, approximately an average of 1,700 POPs are funded at any given time. And the numbers ebb and flow, as you know, on our peak season, we try to have over 2,000 and winter, the number comes down a bit. And our budget was cut by a total of $18 million this fiscal year, but that was all through accruals when we were on pause during the earlier parts of the pandemic. And even now we're maintaining social distancing and we're limited to hiring in the approximately 300 a month as we don't have any class bigger than 10 to 15 people right now. So, so what was the pre-pandemic level of funding for POP? It was approximately 60 million. Six, six, zero? 60? Yeah, six, 60, 60 million, six zero. Oh, wow. So it was cut a lot then. Well, we, we did not hire pops for around you know four or five months, and oh. uh, we were coming from a low number. So the savings were done through the accruals of not having the full staff. Okay, so maybe you can stay on for the for my next question. Uh, given that most seasonal staff are brought in before the fiscal year actually begins. How many part workers are impacted by the $15 million reduction? And how will the reduction impact parks maintenance in the next couple of months as the weather begins to improve? Let me answer the first part and I'll let yeah. Commissioner Stark answer the second. Uh, we, plan, we plan our seasonal plan way in advance and we're gratified that all of those season, the seasonal plan was authorized to move forward uh, we start doing it hiring in March, uh, where we prep for the fields and the pools. And so that hiring and work is underway. So we're very grateful that that seasonal plan was authorized to proceed forward. So we will be ready uh, for the spring. Uh, so that's to answer that question. I'll refer to Commissioner Stark for the second part. So the, the really good news is last July, we had 1,000 pops working for us at a time when we hope to have between 1,800 and 2,000. This July will be much closer to having 2,000 pops working for us, and we will have 1,300 pops by April. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we are also joined by Council Member Holden. Uh, my next question is, uh, the November 2020 savings plan for parks in cool it includes hiring freeze uh, of 46 positions that will generate savings of $1 million starting in fiscal 2022. What job titles exactly are subject to this cut? And again, what will be the anticipated effect of this cut on the, agents, on the agency's operations? Uh, Council Member Kuh, I'll have to get back to you on specifically those 46 positions. I'm not sure the exact titles. There's no question the hiring freeze did affect our operations. Uh, I've met with all my leadership team to find out which ones we have to prioritize. As you know, uh, we're able to hire one for every three positions. Uh, we'll work with OMB to try to restore those positions. In a couple of key areas, it's very critical in our areas of, of technology. Uh, so. This is something we can get you specifically if you wanted to 46 positions, but we are trying to work with OMB to ensure we can get uh, that hiring, uh, the hiring process in place so that we can restore some of these critical functions. Okay, yeah. So the, my next question is regarding uh, one part in the mayor's uh, 2021 day of a city address. Following the release of the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget, the mayor announced several new, in new initiatives in his state of the city address, all of which being creating a city cleanup corps, which proposed to hire 10,000 New Yorkers to clean up neighborhoods. Would the initiative include any support for the park department and how realistic is it considering 
the current budget challenge? Councilmember Ku, thank you for the question. To my knowledge, uh, I believe it is not specifically for parks. I believe these are neighborhoods and streets. And uh, so uh, to my knowledge, these were focused on other areas. If you recall, there was a lot of concern about cuts to sanitation, uh, litter overflowing uh, on trash cans on the streets. And so I know there was a big concern uh, about uh, supplementing uh, what was happening on the streets since a lot of business bids uh, do some of their own uh, sanitation clean up, but my understanding is that was primarily focused on neighborhoods, uh, not focused on parks unless it's the perimeter uh, of a park, which would be the sidewalk. Mm. Okay. So uh, now I will turn over uh, the questions uh, from my colleagues in the committee. Mr. Satori, uh, do we have other council members who want to ask questions? Yes, we do, uh, Chair. Um, uh, thank you. At this time, I'll we'll, uh, we'll call on other council members to ask their questions in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I've called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin delivering or asking your questions. Uh, we will first uh, ha uh, hear questions uh, from Council Member Holden, who will be followed by Council Member Salamanca. Time begins now. Thanks, Commissioner, for all your, your service uh, to the parks uh, of New York City. And uh, I wanna thank you for all the innovative programs you've created in the past. And uh, uh, hopefully, um, uh, they'll they'll go on for years, but I, I just I have so uh, a few questions uh, regarding um, I asked this several times at hearings concerning street trees, uh, and uh, I don't believe I've gotten a, an answer. Of, um, of what's the individual cost of street tree plantings in the city of New York? Uh, I do know we worked on getting that cost down. Uh, I'm going to defer to. Uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh, while I go to my notes, but he may have at the top of his head, prices have gone up, uh, but we've tried to work to get the prices down as low as possible, but I'll now defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh for that response. Thank you, Commissioner Silver. Uh, and yes, the current average cost for planting a tree in New York City is $3,400. Uh, it's less in some boroughs like Staten Island, it's more in Manhattan. Uh, it, is, it has increased significantly over the last three years. Uh, we are taking a number of steps uh, to, uh, to try to reduce those costs, uh, including inc increasing uh, the number of qualified potential bidders uh, for our contracts. Um, we are looking at our specifications to see which ones uh, may be driving uh, the cost increases that we've seen. And we're taking advantage of the new uh, MWBE contracting authority uh, to provide more opportunities in smaller contracts uh, uh, to we hope will result in, in lower prices. We have gotten a few bids back recently. Uh, the results have been encouraging, uh, but we have not awarded any contracts yet. So it's too soon to say whether or not we have uh, found a way to significantly reduce the cost over the entire city. Yeah, $3,400 is obscene. For, for planting a single tree. And uh, it seems that we still don't have a solution to this. I've been, this is going on over a year now uh, that we haven't, that 3,400, we're getting, we're getting um, soaked. The taxpayers of New York City are getting soaked. It's unacceptable. So I, I think we have to come up with an innovative program and not just keep kicking the can down the, the road here. Um, and another question, the commissioner or uh, uh, commissioner Kavanaugh, um, after tropical storm Isaias and other storms, um, several street trees came down, and as you know, and it's, it was really um, quite devastating to many neighborhoods around the city. Um, yet, I still have sidewalks that were lifted considerably that have not been repaired. And one home, home, homeowner uh, constituent sidewalk was so raised by the tree that was uprooted that the homeowner's insurance company 
is, is threatening to drop him, drop his, his insurance because it's a hazard and parks and DOT will not repair the, the storm damage. Um, did, did the parks budget get any more money from the city, uh, extra emergency money to repair sidewalks or trees that were uprooted? Let me defer to the Commissioner Kavanaugh, you're correct. Uh, this is primarily DOT with some uh, parks involvement, but I'll defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh uh, for that response. Uh, Council member, yes, uh, we are keenly aware of the sidewalks that were damaged by Tropical Storm ECES. The Parks Department, with working with DOT, has identified uh, over 600 sidewalks citywide that need to be repaired. We, the Parks Department, have completed removal of any stumps uh, that were in the way that would have made sidewalk repair difficult. DOT is working through the contracting process to actually uh, do the repairs. Um, and uh, we should have a, uh, have a projected date soon as to when that work will start. Uh, but if you have an instance where someone is facing the situation that you described, uh, please give us the details and we will try to work with that. I, I did that commissioner and still no, no movement and the homeowner's insurance will be dropped. So this is outrageous that we're victims, or ho the homeowners are victims, obviously, if the tree comes down and damages uh, not only their block and the, and the sidewalks, and then they, they can't get it fixed. And, um, you know, we need to know, we, we can't have this uh, ping pong game going between DOT and parks. Who's responsible? Who's going to fix it? And when are they going to fix it? And they, do they have to deal, they have to do this in a timely um, basis because, the, the, the sidewalk is lifted like three feet still and people can't walk. And we have this all over the city. So it, there's, there's gotta be emergency money put aside. Uh, also on, on that, I've got, you know, and, and, and another issue is I've gotten several complaints that restrooms are being closed in parks at, at 3 p.m. When, when, when our, our, our uh, obviously our residents need the parks more than ever now. So, is, is that really a, a kind of citywide policy or is that individual district managers deciding to, to cut corners? Uh, it's not a question of cutting corners, council member. Uh, during the late fall, winter and early spring, uh, we do reduce our, our comfort station hours, mostly because we do not have the seasonal staff to extend those hours. Typically in mid-March, we start building back up as the seasonal staff comes on board throughout the agency. But, uh, but so you'll be seeing restrooms. longer hours regularly. Then close the park if you if you're not going to where you know people have to you know have to go to the bathroom have to go to the restroom, so to close it at three, um, you know when the parks is, is, are are being heavily used especially in early spring is is cruel. Councilmember, we do make that adjustment and we'll make sure that it is followed consistently uh, throughout the city, especially in your district. Could you could you t could you um, answer uh, and I'll just one more if, if I may uh, if I may chair could you who's working remotely in parks are, are park supervisors working remotely or district managers are they allowed to work remotely? Uh, no, I, I have to uh, say and give a lot of credit to our field staff. They have worked every day since the start of the pandemic outdoors, interacting with the public. Uh, and doing their job as normal. There are- What, what titles are working remotely? Because I've, I've seen a lot of parks- We have, uh, we have roughly about 20% of our administrative staff is working remotely. About 80% of all of our uh, staff that work in the field uh, are working in the field. So it's about 20%, uh, mostly uh, from our capital, uh, our administrative, our uh, IT folks, uh, they're all working, teleworking remotely, but it's about 20%. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next is Council Member Salamanca, followed by Council Member Diaz. Time begins. All right, good morning, Commissioner. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good morning. First, Commissioner, I just want to say how sad I was to hear that you are leaving the Parks Department. Um, I've been working in government as a district manager and as a council member. Uh, for the last 11 years now and um and i prior to that i was a community board member and community board too i have never dealt with a commissioner who actually listened to the community and i just want to say thank you for all of your hard work and your partnership and working with residents here in the south bronx um it was through your initiative that uh 
my district got at least uh, six to seven playgrounds either renewed or brand new playgrounds. And this was through the Parks and Community Partnership Initiative that you uh, incorporated. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Now, um, what I do know, do, my, I do want to talk a little bit about my frustrations with the Parks Department, and that's cap, capital dollars. Um, Commissioner, in, in, 20, in 2018, we allocated close to, I would say, a little under $2 million between the mayor and myself for um, baseball lights in two baseball fields in my, in my community. This is fiscal year 2018. It is, still, I, 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 it is still in the procurement process. It is unacceptable that this is still going through the procurement process. Um, and at the last hearing that I saw you face to face, I would say a year ago, you, you agreed that this was unacceptable. And here we are today working on fiscal year 2022, and I still, it's still going through the procurement process. In 2019, I allocated uh, a, a mobile command uh, station for Cortona Park. It's still nothing. You know, um, I'm talking to the, the assistant commissioner for Urban Park Services, and I feel like I'm getting the runaround here. You know, one, one, um, one explanation is that DCAS is holding it back. Another explanation is that OMB is holding it back. And to be quite frank, Commissioner, I don't think I'm going to allocate any funding to Parks Department for capital dollars if I'm giving you um, this capital dollars and it's just sitting there. It's a waste. Well, I'm going to defer to uh, uh, Commissioner Braddock shortly. Uh, clearly, part of that was COVID, but I know that's not going to satisfy your response. You know, I, let me just say it this way. While I have been here, we have made substantial progress in the capital process. I'll be the first to tell you when I came on board, I was stunned on how long it took to complete a capital project. We reformed the design uh, phase, uh, were able to exceed uh, timelines on the construction side, even completing it on time. And I concur that more work is needed on the procurement side. Uh, and so that is something that unfortunately I will not be able to complete, but I'm confident that this council and the future mayor needs to focus on the procurement. However, uh, I wanna get the details about what happened. Uh, any capital project has to go through the same timeline uh, because it's capital dollars. So it is unfortunate and I will defer to Commissioner Braddock to find out more detail. But as you know, I've worked very hard to get as many projects done in your community. There was no intent on slowing this down. Um, I'm equally uh, frustrated at times by the process, but however, we've made substantial changes over the past seven years and I'm confident those those improvements will occur even better into the future. Commissioner, the Hunts Point Playground that you, that we uh, we did a ribbon cutting, um, I think that you approved it around the same time that I allocated this funding. The park got redone, we did a ribbon cutting, and my project is still in the procurement process. And a park got completed during that time. I, I hear you. Uh, we uh, All of us agree that improvements have been made and more improvements need to be made in the procurement process. Uh, and so, after this meeting, I'll sit down and find out exactly specifically what's happening with your projects. So you're not hearing from different parts of the agency. You're hearing from me directly and Commissioner Braddock of Capital so we can get you straight answers and find out what's going on. I share your frustration. I know you called me. You're committed to providing quality parks for your community. I feel the same way you do. And I will figure out uh, in the time I have left what we need to do to unstick and move those projects forward because I do not want you to stop funding our parks. You know how important it is to the community. And so let's figure this out because I know your heart, I know how much you love parks. Uh, and so we'll have to figure this out together. Is the, is the commissioner for capital on that you can answer some of these questions? Um, yes, council member, and thank you very much. And I, uh, I share your concern uh, as does commissioner Silver. And you know that we do, we try to do our best to move things along as quickly as possible. I understand about the, the two ball field, uh, um, the lighting, both at Bill Rainey and at uh, Julio Caraballo. Um, it, it's just unfortunate because um, last year when those projects were stuck in procurement, everything was put on pause at that point in time and is only being lifted by OMB as of the end of March this year. So this funding was allocated in fiscal year 18 commissioner. 18, you cannot use the excuse of COVID when you had this money since fiscal year 18. 
I that's an excuse. I understand your fr frustration. I, I'm uh, I, sorry you, you feel that way. It's just that we were not allowed to move the projects through any project, any project that was in procurement at the time that OMB paused those were not allowed to move forward. So unfortunately that those two projects got stuck along with about 300 other projects at the same time. However, we have the very, very good news that those projects are being unpaused as of March 26th. You are best to move them as quickly as possible. Okay. All right, thank Council you, Member Salamanca, are you okay? Yeah. To stop? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, we will go to, we will be going to a second round of questions. So, Council, uh, my colleagues, please limit your questions to five minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. We'll do Coote. a second one later. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Chair Coot. Uh, the next Council Member of Questions is Council Member Diaz, who will be followed by Council Member Joni. Time begins. Good morning. I want to thank both Chair Ku for this opportunity to bring forth this conversation and for Commissioner Silver for the excellent work of our trash removal that's occurring in my biggest local park, which is Highland Park. My question is more towards noise pollution, which is growing in high records in Highland Park, in the upper Highland Park near the monastery. I would like to know what conversations you're having or you have had in reference to the noise pollution, my understanding is we have about 25 nuns there in retirement age who are looking to exit that area due to the noise pollution in, by their residents. That's Thank my you. first question. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, this is the first I'm hearing about it. Uh, I will work with our Urban Park Service, that's our Parks and Force Patrol, uh, to find out what's going on, as well as the Park Administrator. Uh, I'm, a, I'm not sure whether it's noise. We have seen a trend of young people on motorcycles and making loud noise, whether it's amplified music because people just want to get out those for COVID. I'm not sure the noise you're referring to, but I will reach out to the park administrator as well as the park and force patrol to go by the location you're referring to to find out what's going on. And then we'll figure out uh, what remedy is necessary. I apologize, I'll be more direct. When I, when I say noise pollution, I, I'm four foot nine and a quarter, and the speakers that are being established there between five and 10, you know, are taller than I am. So it's, it, I'm extremely saddened and disturbed by the fact that this conversation has not been elevated to you. To you. Then my next question is in reference to forestry. As, as the park is being utilized more so than ever, my understanding as early as this morning, there was a conversation with forestry in removing the branches and pruning the trees. They're waiting for, I don't know if it's for a senior to be bumped in the head by a branch or what's gonna get the attention that we need at Highland Park. Forestry is saying mid to early summer, they're gonna go and take care of what I see to be an urgent issue. Well, I'm gonna defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh in a second. Our approach is a risk-based approach, uh, and what happens is that they determine uh, what is the highest risk from A, B, C, and D, and then they have a certain time frame to go out there and address the situation. Uh, I'm, I'll defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh specifically about Highland Park. We do benefit from having an administrator there, but also our forestry team is the best in the country. Uh, so I'm sure we do not want to keep the public in danger. I'll defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh if you know specifically about the situation uh, in the park. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Silver. And good morning, Council Member. Uh, good morning. I, I'm not personally familiar with the situation that you described, but as Commissioner Silver did say, uh, we base our maintenance program on, on risk. <coughs> uh, we evaluate the trees based on the, the potential that they have for causing injury or, or property damage. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we prioritize our work accordingly. Uh, however, uh, we'll be happy to review the, uh, the, the problem that you've identified and see if there is some way that we can address it, uh, both within the context of our priorities and in, the, uh, in, in, re in response to the, to the problems that uh, it appears to be causing. And so within what time frame can I expect a callback? It's gonna be 70 degrees today. And the last thing I want is to be told, I had a call at seven o'clock this morning and seven o'clock this evening, a branch fell 
on someone. Council member, we'll certainly call you this afternoon to understand exactly what you're talking about. I don't know if we'll be able to go out and assess the situation until sometime early next week. Uh, but obviously if there was a, a dangerous condition, we would be out there assessing it today. Um, I don't know what the, you know, the history of the inspection is for this particular condition that you're concerned about, but we will call you today to confirm what, what it is, where it is, and we will have a, an inspection performed and, and inform you of the results. No, I, I, again, maybe I wasn't clear in my question or expressing myself. My understanding is that it has been assessed and the return time for rectifying the situation is mid, mid spring to early summer. I have an issue with that. Council again, I'm not familiar with the particulars of this condition, uh, but again, based on the risk that it presents and the volume of work that we have to address, it may take that long to, uh, to uh, address a condition. Right, thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, we are also joined by Council Member Mark Devane. Uh, thank Mr. you, Chair. Stachori, who is the next council yes, member to ask us? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, next council member is Council Member Jonai, followed by Council Member Moya. Time begins. Thank you, Chair Ku. Um, Commissioner Silver, I just want to echo some of the comments made by my colleagues. Um, I've enjoyed working with you alongside of you. Uh, I'm grateful for the service that you've done to the parks and the city of New York. I know that at many times we butted heads, it was with the intention of solving problems. I hope with the amount of, the short amount of time you have left in the current position, that you will finally figure out the capital procurement problem, the debacle with comfort stations, uh, and all of the trees that need to be removed and all the sidewalks that need to be repaired. I have trust in you, and I'm hopeful that you're gonna to say today that Yes, before you leave, you will address these issues. Uh, thank you, Council Member Jonai. Uh, that is a hard charge for three months, but the good news is uh, we have addressed the comfort station issue. We've managed to control costs. We actually did a very interesting exercise last year to look at a different approach toward comfort stations. So that is ready to go uh, once we try that pilot. So at least that way we can check the box. In terms of capital, I know over the years I've taken a, a lot of heat, but I have to say, I am, I'm gonna be personally and say this with the capital staff that we're extremely proud of what we were able to do. This administration has now completed under my tenure over 843 capital projects. That is the third most in history of all commissioners. I've only been here now for seven years. We were able to cut the process from four to six months. COVID did pause a lot of our projects, and so I'm confident, as I stated uh, uh, to Council Member Salamanca, we really have to work as a team, not just parks, the city and a team to address procurement. We've been able to streamline design and we're performing very well in construction Our procurement continues to be a challenge. I think once you focus on that aspect of the process, you're gonna see projects move a lot quicker. I'll try to do as much as I can or leave a letter for the next mayor in an envelope because we don't have enough time to reform procurement in three months. But I want to thank this mayor. I want to thank OMB for the improvements we have made as well as other agencies, but there's still more work to do. Commissioner, thank you for that. And the, uh, the sincerity in your voice resonates with all of us. Thank you. The tree problem is a major concern, not only from the liability aspects of safety of those that can't use the sidewalks and those that can by using the sidewalks to the liability that falls on um, homeowners, as you heard from my other colleague there, the insurance now is not going to be removed. These are having real impact. These are the single largest investments of our homeowners. It's not the responsibility of the homeowner. If they touch it now, it becomes their problem. We really need to do or put more effort and resources and a true commitment to resolving these problems that are hazards uh, to both pedestrians and homeowners. Uh, understood, Council Member. And as Commissioner Kavanaugh said, uh, we will be reaching out to DOT today uh, to get a better understanding of the timeline about how we can proceed. We understand the impact, and Council Member Holden was very clear. Uh, we do not want our homeowners and our residents to be put in that position. Uh, we'll gather this afternoon to figure out what we can do to move quicker going forward. Don't know if it's an option for emergency uh, dollars or 
certainly I would say this is a crisis and it's a concern. We'll certain back, circle back to see what we can do to give the homeowners uh, more uh, certainty about how the future is going to unfold regarding uh, those sidewalk conditions. Commissioner, if I can have your office follow up with me, I have a list of properties that are similar to what uh, Councilmember Holden uh, raised as an example, where the sidewalk is more than two feet off the ground, unpassable, and it's been a number of years. I don't know, few of other properties. And I just want to continue um, as we talk about the procurement process and how we move forward. I'm a uh, big fan of concessions. So even Orchard Beach, and the um, tens of millions of dollars that are going to be needed to bring that uh, our parks up to uh, date and uh, reinvest in that uh, wonderful uh, beach of ours, we should be looking at concessions put into the hands of those that can do this. They can do it with their money. We can oversee it. Uh, it would be a partnership that I think we would all benefit, especially in the times of economic uh, crisis such as this, where we're looking at budget cuts. Let's save taxpayer dollars. We can use the concessions that are out there that would love to take on this project, take advantage of that 1,000 car parking lot that you have and that beautiful beach that we have along with all the amenities that make Orchard Beach such an attractive place in New York City's largest park. Well, Council Member John, I may be ahead of your time. Uh, Orchard Beach project is restarting. And so, you know, concessions is envisioned by being part of that redesigned pavilion. So uh, you're right on target. You and I have talked about this. Uh, we will see as a project unfolds, but there's certainly a, a desire to have concession there. And as I just wrap it up, uh, Chair Ku, Commissioner. I just yeah, please, yeah, please, please yeah, do yeah. it as soon well, fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just to throw out a big shout out because you're, I'm only fond of one other person more than you at Parks Department, and that is the Bronx Commissioner, Iris Rodriguez. So second to her, Commissioner, you are my favorite commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your service as well. Thank you. Uh, next uh, council member was with questions is council member Moya who will be followed by council member Levine. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Chair Ku. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, good morning, uh, Commissioner Silver. Uh, just wanted to, again, uh, reiterate just what my colleague said. Thank you for your service to the city of New York. Uh, we really appreciate it. I had to phone my mother to let her know that the person that was responsible for getting her hooked onto that website uh, is now finally leaving, uh, but uh, she wants to say thank you on uh, her behalf. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, our Queens Commissioner, Commissioner Dockett, who has been absolutely fantastic, responsive uh, at every uh, call that we make, and um, Matt Sheraton, who is the administrator for uh, uh, Community Boards 3 and 4, both have been fantastic, Commissioner, and they deserve recognition. Uh, now getting to the question is, uh, I know that we're talking about uh, uh, opening up our parks and the usage here. Um, for me, uh, I think I've expressed this to you and, and to several folks in the administration here uh, about uh, the, the issues that we're having in our parks in districts like mine, uh, where our children, our seniors can't utilize this. They're, it's being overrun by people who are uh, either smoking marijuana or drinking in public. Uh, it's become a major issue for us um, now for years. Uh, I talk about this because I wanted to ask you, um, you know, what is the current level of funding for the PEP officers this year? Um, and also, you know, considering the, the, the recent dramatic increase in park usage, what would be the ideal number of PEP officers uh, and urban rangers needed to patrol our parks? I want to acknowledge all the PEP officers uh, in Queens and throughout the city who have been doing a tremendous job. Uh, I've had the privilege of actually going out to the parks with them uh, and having the opportunity to see them not only distribute masks, but help uh, actually uh, curb some of the problems that we're having. It's just that there's not enough staffing to do it. Um, and when I have five parks being overrun, uh, that's something that you know is not acceptable. The, that is one of the number one complaints I get in the, in the community. Well, first, uh, thank you uh, for, for your comments. And please tell your mother, I may be moving on, but the tree map will remain. So <laughs> staff will do a good, very good job. I, I want to thank you for the comment and also acknowledging our Park Force Patrol and Urban Park Rangers. You know, they have been unbelievable uh, that they had to go out there, not just a pandemic. Remember, we have a lot of protests out in our parks. 
And they also supported helping some of the commercial districts for those businesses following uh, social distancing rules. So they have been amazing uh, throughout this process coming to work. Uh, so our current level, I don't know the actual budget number, but I can tell you that the total number of uh, our PEP, both grants and tax levy is 311. Now that's higher than previous years, but then it's supplemented by our CSAs that's called Park Security. It's about 373. Now the PEP, the 311, they're peace officers, they enforce the quality of life rules, so they can make an arrest. The CSAs have a radio, they'll have to call for support, they cannot issue an arrest. I agree with you, uh, I would certainly like to have more, but in terms of crime, uh, and, and we do quality of life uh, uh, summonses, but we rely on our partnership with NYPD to support us. Uh, we have uh, 311, uh, they have 35,000. So I have to tell you, we wanna make sure we establish a strong relationship, particularly in Flushing Meadow Corona Park, where we have one, but that is a problem. After this meeting, we're gonna circle back with you to find out exactly where this is happening, because we certainly want our seniors and our children to endure public spaces, particularly during COVID, when it's more and more important. So the numbers are 311. Uh, it was a little bit different during COVID because we had to redeploy them. So people weren't in locations they weren't supposed to be. So they were doing a lot of work, uh, but we use a hotspot approach where we have substations in certain locations. We know the locations where they have to go and patrol, but if there's an area that's of a concern, let us know. We'll send a team out there and we'll get the support of NYPD if that's what is needed. I, I've done that, Commissioner. I've had okay. NYPD sit with 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 your uh, Commissioner of PEP uh, 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 Enforcement. Uh, this is now going on close to five years. Uh, I've even allocated money to put uh, a, a substation at Park of the Americas. I have Flushing Meadows Corona Park, but I have parks that are located across the street from schools. We have, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who complain about not only the the drunks but the marijuana smoke. Uh, you know, urination in the parks. I mean, this is, we're overrun and I'm not using that word lightly. Uh, we are overrun here. And that's why I'm asking, has that been considered uh, given the usage to increase the number uh, for, for PEP officers uh, in this budget? No, uh, there is no increase in the PEP, PEP uh, the line for, for PEP. It will stay consistent. Right now, uh, I, don't, I don't know offhand if there are any vacancies, Right. Yeah, we're right now at 311 citywide for our for our pet. That's just not enough. That's not even enough to to, to cover uh, Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Uh, you know, we we have uh, one of the, the the third or fourth largest park mm -hmm. in the city. Um, you know, it's incredible that we are not putting in uh, money uh, allocated in this budget to actually secure our parks and make people in the city of New York and our seniors, our children feel safe and that it is being utilized in the appropriate manner. Not just that it's a park, it's open and anyone can do whatever they want. It is so critical, Commissioner, I cannot stress it enough that we need to include money to increase the number of PEP officers uh, in the parks department. Yeah, one second, I'm sorry. Uh, this is my colleague was is updating me with some information. While it's not a consolation for this budget, I do want to let you know that during this administration, number of PEP have doubled. Uh, uh, so clearly this is a conversation will continue uh, as we see the recovery underway. I understand what you're saying. Um, I'll check back with our staff to find out what is happening with those conversations with NYPD. Because uh, I do believe with the current staffing levels, we should be able to address the problem. That is unacceptable. That's what's happening. But this administration doubled the numbers. Uh, all I can say is as this uh, budget process continues, we'll elevate the concerns people are having and yours in particular. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilman Moya. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not the chair is blocking it. Thank so, you. So, uh, next. Mr. So the next, yeah. Yes. Uh, next up is Council Member Levine. Time begins. Well, thank you so much, Chair Ku, and, uh, and I hate to be repetitive, Commissioner, but I am so grateful for your leadership for our city's parks over the past seven years. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure to work with you, for me personally, both in my term as Chair of the Parks Committee and in the year since. Uh, I'm just so grateful for the City Parks and Community Parks Initiative, Anchor Parks Initiative, uh, Parks Without Borders, and 
uh, your vision of an urban planner who understood that you have to weave together parks with the surrounding neighborhoods. So thank you for that. Uh, and I, I certainly wish you much, much success in the years ahead. Um, uh, I wonder if you have data on the usage of parks over the past year, which I had to say anecdotally feels like one of the most heavy years of use ever. Do, do we actually have numbers on that? We do not have numbers. We reached out to our partners. Uh, putting Highline aside because it was a unique type of park that was more right. of a structure in the park. But across the board, uh, just anecdotally, they were all telling us that we saw record numbers. Um, I live near Prospect Park. I was stunned what I saw uh, going there some evenings, uh, seeing more people there. You thought a concert was underway. So the answer is yes, uh, because it was the only social gathering place open that everyone was using everything for parks. We don't have solid numbers, but we can tell by the level of trash that was collected and by just staff telling us how crowded parks were. So the answer is yes. Right, and absolutely. No and, and I've seen it myself in parks in uptown Manhattan. Uh, just extraordinary. I mean, th th thank goodness for our parks over the past year. I can't even imagine what hell we would have been through without them. But this was a year in which we endured a, a very substantial cut to staffing. Uh, CPWs, which are maintenance workers, gardeners, uh, PEP officers, uh, urban park rangers. And so we were in effect asking this staff to do more uh, with less help in a year where we also had the complication of the COVID safety protocols. And I mean, this is probably the hardest year to have been a parks worker, maybe ever, but definitely in recent memory. And uh, so, so and, 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 and I'm sure you understand that. And it's just critical that we restore those cuts. First and foremost, because there's just so much work to do in the parks to keep them well-maintained and beautiful and safe. But also, I think just in fairness to the workers who have endured uh, such a rough year. Um, what, what, is, what is the restoration in, in, this, in the executive budget at this point? And understanding that the executive budget was prepared before the um, federal stimulus was passed. Does the six billion dollars coming to the city uh, mean that we can now restore those cuts? Well, in terms of the cuts, and first, thank you for those comments. I also appreciated working with you both as parks chair and then after. Uh, number one, uh, there were restorations uh, after the budget uh, for the pools, pruning, seasonals, OTPS. Uh, and so those were restored. So we're very happy that uh, as of this month, OMB gave us approval to proceed with hiring those seasonals uh, so we could start prepping our fields and pools. It'll happen this year in this fiscal budget, but the, the cut last year was a one-year cut. So FY 2022, we'll see uh, what, similar to what the budget was uh, before the pandemic. So those restorations are in place. So that's the answer to that specific question. Uh, in terms of some of the other one shots, you know, I certainly understand last year when 150,000 CPWs and, and, and horticulture workers were cut, that will be an ongoing conversation. Uh, clearly the Parks Department have proven how valuable they are uh, during both regular times, but more importantly during the pandemic. And I'm sure that will be a major part of the conversation as we move toward uh, the executive budget. You have... Thank you, sorry, a little mute problem there. Okay. Uh, my time is almost up. Uh, we need not just the baseline cuts restored, but we need all of the, uh, the single year allocations that the Playfair Coalition succeeded in getting through with, with incredible advocacy from the council speaker and so many allies. Um, we need all of that restored uh, for the coming year. And, and just in my time, very quick, I also want to mention um, the the challenges faced in our historic houses and the parks system is, is, is home to dozens of incredible treasures. Um, one of which is just a few blocks from my home, Morris Jamal Mansion. And that they're in such desperate need, virtually all of them in cap in an infusion of capital to upgrade uh, their infrastructure. Can, can you update us on the plan there and what can be done to to get them the resources they need in an expeditious fashion. Well, uh, well I know time is running out, but I'll have uh, 
Commissioner Braddock follow up with you. Uh, I don't have the full capital plan of all the Stark houses, but I do know some capital work is going on with a few of them, but we can get back to you uh, with a list. If you want to know specifically about Jamal mentioned, we can get to that information as well. I do know there was a capital project some years ago. I don't know what's in the planning going forward. I, I would appreciate that to, to talk to Commissioner Braddock. It's not, it's not just Morris Jamal, it's many of them uh, throughout the system. Uh, they have real needs. And I think now's the time to double down in investments there. My time Thank is you. up. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll now return to Council, uh, Chair Ku and other council members for a second round of questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for your patience. Yeah. My next question is about forestry and horticulture. Uh, the fiscal 2022 preliminary plan includes $26 million allocation for forestry and horticulture. It is less than 5% of the total past budget of $533 million. So do you consider this funding to be sufficient to properly maintain our natural forests in the air era of climate change? Well, my first part of the answer is yes, uh, because there were just some reductions in this fiscal year, going forward is gonna be similar than previous fiscal years and we got the job done. We have an amazing forestry division. I would say it is the best in the country. Uh, they know the importance of maintaining our urban forests for all the reasons you mentioned. And we also have the Natural Area Conservancy, another huge partner. Together, we have advanced tremendously the urban canopy and the health of our urban forests uh, in our city. So I do believe we have the adequate budget to get the job done. I will defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh to see if he has any additional comments. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Silver. And yes, as you note, the FY22 preliminary budget includes uh, the contract funding level that we had in prior years, it will allow us to resume our uh, block pruning cycle, which is the cornerstone of our, our maintenance program, and also to resume at a higher level the stump removal program. Uh, there is an enormous amount uh, of value in our tree uh, urban forest, uh, and there is an unending list of things that we could do there, but with the preliminary funding that included in the budget, uh, we will be able to resume the level of service that we had provided in prior years. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, my, my next question is uh, concerning the concessions. The actual revenue generated by the concessions in fiscal 2020 was $38 million. So the, what is the anticipated total revenue generated by concession in fiscal 2021? I will. Is that this page? Two? Okay. Just give me one second. That is a very sure. specific number. So, right now, uh, for the first part of this year revenue, it's 10.5 million. Uh, and clearly this is gonna be uh, significantly less than later years. So it's for the first six months uh, was approximately 10.5 million. For and fiscal 2021? For fiscal 2021. Okay. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, for a lot of our concessions uh, during COVID, uh, they were concerned about opening. Uh, we worked with those that had food operations to give them guidance about how they can open, but there were others who just felt it was not beneficial to do so. If there were some other tennis facilities with bubbles, they were not able to open. So we could all imagine last year was a, not a good year, but our revenue division worked very closely with each concession. Those that could open, we let them know how to open, but this includes tennis, golf course, as well as our food and eating establishments. Uh, it was a challenging year. Uh, we did not charge any fees to make sure it was as easy for them to operate and provide a service for employees. But in terms of the revenue, uh, it is up to 10.5 million so far uh, for this fiscal year. 
So have any concession agreements been revert or amended in response to COVID? They're not being amended. They're, in terms of COVID, no. Uh, there have none that have been quote unquote revoked due to COVID. Or by amended, no. Have you... Nor amended. We just, our staff, we understand what was happening to COVID under the circumstances. We've worked with our concessions. There are, although they pay us, uh, the fees and revenue from what they generate, we also knew they were in the midst of a pandemic. And so we worked with them to make sure that they could continue. Uh, and there were a number of different things that we were able to do with them, uh, but we did not amend their agreements. There was latitude within our existing agreements to work uh, with our concessions. So is there any uh, flat fee or a minimum that the concessions uh, must pay regardless of whether they are operating or not? That is a, let me respond to this way. No rent has been charged for any of our concessions that have been closed due to the pandemic. Uh, I don't know all the contracts to know what they were obligated to pay. Certainly if they did make some revenue, I don't think there's someone from our revenue division here to respond to that question. We can certainly get back to you on that one. But I have to say, we really work closely uh, with our concessions to make sure that they were not victims of the pandemic. Because uh, again, they provide a very useful amenity to our park users. Okay, yeah. So, uh, okay, my, my next question is, uh, is about historic houses. So during our hearing on the historic houses last year, we learned the biggest need is for someone to do minor historic buildings maintenance, like repairing windows and plaster. This position has been empty since 2016, and we heard there are concerns that it might no longer be a line item. Can you confirm whether the position still exists? Uh, I'm, I don't know if uh, Commissioner Biedemann will be able to answer that question. I do know after the hearing, we sat down closely with both the administrator uh, to address some of the concerns raised at that hearing. I do not recall specifically about the position that you mentioned. There were other concerns raised at that hearing. So I don't know, I don't wanna put Commissioner Biedemann on the spot. Uh, this was something I wasn't, uh, I'm not 100% clear on. So Commissioner Biedemann, do you have any other information or Commissioner Braddock, because this is something uh, was not brought to my attention about this position. So thanks, uh, Commissioner, and uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Koo. Um, again, this is per um, Commissioner Silver, um, sort of globally looking at how can, how can we respond to um, some of the uh, some of the information that we got um, in and around the hearing around uh, on historic houses um, has been an area of focus for both me and Commissioner Braddock. I don't have an immediate answer for you about that particular position though, and I will be happy to circle back with you after the hearing. So you will get back to us. Yes, This is a very simple question, whether the position exists or not. Yeah, yeah I'm just not sure you were talking about a maintenance position. Uh, I know each of the Stark homes, you know, have their own staff. I'm just trying to understand we say the position. I'm not aware of a global maintenance position specifically for historic houses. So that's why I'm pausing. Um, I'm a little bit unclear about the question and about this position you're referring to. So that's why I'm saying it is a simple question. I just want to understand uh, what position you're referring to because to my knowledge, there is not a maintenance person per se for all the historic houses. There tends to be different arrangements. We do have our trades that can support, but they do raise their own funds to do some cosmetic work, but in terms of what you're asking for, I just have to double check. Okay, so, so please get back to us, yeah. So many, many of the historic houses have had to pivot due to the pandemic, but have had trouble with their internet and outdated te technology. Some have received capital funding for technology upgrades. If historic houses is given capital funding for technology upgrades. Is PASS able to take it on their project? 
That is all, it's a good question. Uh, not all technology uh, request is capital, it could be expense. I'd have to find out uh, what type of technology they're talking about, whether it could be bundled uh, as a capital project or it could be expense funding. So that's something too I'm gonna have to get back to you on because I was not aware that there were some technology issues with the historic houses. So that is something that if it's expense, we can easily address. Uh, so that is something else that we promise to get back to you uh, with a response. Okay, yeah, please get back to us and we will communicate with you, yeah. Um, the next question is on the PSAL Sports Public Schools Athletic League. The mayor recently announced that PSAL Sports will receive an extended season. Can you speak to the impact this would have on long PSAL leagues, such as adult leagues and summer camps? Well, first, uh, let me start by saying that, yes, last week announced we're working very closely uh, with PSAL regarding the details of their upcoming plan to offer multi-season sports in the upcoming spring and summer months. We'll work with PSL leagues and other permittees to accommodate as much of the usage as possible. As I've also stated that we were, our seasonal plan was, uh, we're allowed to start hiring for our seasonal employees. And so that will help us prepare the fields for PSAL. Uh, but the answer is we are now working with PSAL uh, for that one. And we're also working on our capacity for uh, both summer camps uh, as well. So that work initiated after the mayor's announcement. Okay, so have you thought of uh, about ways to extending playing time to accommodate more leads? Uh, we will look uh, to see what the permitting situation looks like and what the demand is. Clearly we always focus on youth first and then adults second. Uh, so we'll see what the capacity is, we'll see what the demand is, and then we'll make determinations. Uh, but since the mayor's announcement, we are very quickly uh, trying to make sure how we could accommodate uh, all those who want to have permits this summer and spring. Okay, before I go to the next one of questions, uh, Mr. Statori, do we have any more council members who want to ask questions? Yes, Council, Council Member Salamanca uh, would be next for questions. Okay. Time begins. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna go back um, on, on my questions regarding capital dollars. Um, in fiscal year 2019, I allocated funding for an emergency uh, command station for Cortona Park. Um, there was a back and forth uh, um, with your agency. And then in December of 2019, I was informed by the assistant commissioner, I have it documented, that told me that DCAS has given the approval to purchase this vehicle. Now, if DCAS gave the approval to purchase it, that means that OMB gave them the approval. Therefore, this vehicle should have been purchased. Can you please, can, I don't know if there's someone there from the capital division, can they explain to me why this vehicle has not been purchased if DCAS gave the green light pre-COVID? Uh, I don't know if Commissioner Braddock, can, I don't know if Commissioner Stark, I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, I will get you the answer of someone on this call because we are limited to the number of commissioners that can speak. Uh, Commissioner Do you have a commissioner that, that's in charge of capital? Um, capital, but in terms of fleet, uh, fleet is, is, is a different commission. All right. Um, my other question is in regards to gardens. I have quite a few gardens. I, I think I have a little over two dozen gardens in my in my council district, um, and we allocate funding to the gardens. Um, and something that I found interesting in some of these gardens that I know that are highly used, um, they order porta potties, and I've allocated funding for these porta potties. Well, I was under the impression that I was allocating funding for these porta potties, but it's my understanding uh, that. Uh, the individuals in charge of the gardens were being charged for the porta potties, um, and I wanted to know if, if you can uh, if you can possibly explain why are uh, individuals who are taking care of the gardens uh, being charged by the parks department for porta potties? Okay, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Matt Jury to respond to that question. All right. 
that's the green thumb who's who's um who, who's uh, requiring them to pay for porta potties. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I think you're referring to a, a, a discretionary allocation award made, uh, and I my, my recollection was that, uh, and I, I'm happy to double back and check the exact award because um, I'm not familiar if it was this fiscal year or previous fiscal year. I know you've made si similar allocations like that in the past. And the way it generally works is that your allocation goes to a, a third party organization, you know, nonprofit that, you know, has activity within the parks. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes makes purchases, uh, rentals, if you will. Uh, but I don't believe there should be any personal obligation of the actual garden members themselves. It, you know, I think the, the rental should be administered either through the agency, that's one way to do it, uh, or, or through a third party organization through, through the council's uh, discretionary award uh, system. Well, I highly recommend that you look into this through Green Thumb because it's my, I know for a fact, and I found this out recently, and I was really taken back by it, that Green Thumb was charging uh, the individuals who were registered as being in charge of gardens for paying out of pocket for these porta potties. And um, that shouldn't be happening. It, it, I mean, just a quick, a quick clarification, because of the way the, the council's award process works, the organization was, was offered an award. That award does need to be front-loaded, if you will. It's a reimbursement-based system, but, I, but that shouldn't be well, It may be that the organization that received the award has to front, you know, front those expenses. That's, that's quite common with... In fact, I believe that's, that's the fundamental way in which the council discretionary awards work. But but we'll absolutely, you know, we'll get the information from your office and, and look into this and make sure that it seems odd that individuals would be asked to, you know, pay or, or, or you know, uh, for that, that seems unusual. All right. Well, I look forward to hearing from you as soon as next week, now that the good weather is upon us and, you know, garden work has begun. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Salamanca. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next so up is we have one more. Okay. Yes, Councilmember. Uh, next up is Councilmember Holden. I believe has a question. Time begins. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the you know the hearing on the uh, commissioner the hearing on the historic houses, which we had the first one we had in five years was back in November, and there were very serious um, questions uh, from the. Um, the, the people uh, uh, who run the historic houses about the maintenance. And, and the chair asked a question about, has that been addressed or has that position been filled? And the answer was, we're looking at this, uh, globally looking at this. That's unacceptable to me, that four months have gone by and these historic houses are many times putting off vital maintenance that can, can hurt the structure of the of the house and the operation of the house and actually cost more money in the long run that that has not been addressed in four months since our hearing it's like what are we wasting our time on here on hearings if things are not going to be addressed and and to come up with uh, we're globally looking at this is just bureaucratic mumbo jumbo and i'm sick of it i'm sick of the i'm sick of going you know we're, for months four months when we get nothing done that's, that, that answer should have been forthcoming. It should have been, here's what we're doing. And the fact that it's not happening is scary. It's scary. And, and, I, and we're going to have to have another hearing chair if they can't answer your simple questions about a position. So I'm outraged. I'm, out, I'm also, I want to uh, just piggyback on what uh, uh, Council Member Salamanca said about the capital budget, because it goes into this vast... Uh, a void in parks. And I, I am seriously considering not funding any more capital projects in parks. I know you've done some great things, Commissioner, but still we're, at, we're into everything keeps going up and up. It doubles and triples in price. And it's not even like in the realm of, of really correct prices for the city of New York. We're getting, like I said before, on the, um, the tree planting, 3,400. And, and just a few years ago, it was half that. And just a couple of years before that, it was a quarter of that. So prices, we have to do it. We have to do a hearing. It looks like in the council um, on out of out of control costs and why these costs are so ridiculous in capital and in parks, and why it costs thirty four hundred dollars to 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 plant a tree uh, in the city of New York when it used to cost. I, I remember years ago four hundred. I don't get it. 
Well, uh, council member, number one, after the hearing, even you and I had a conversation and I met with my leadership team specifically to follow up on some key items. There was a question specifically about a position. We're in a hiring freeze, uh, but we met right after, raised the concerns from that historic house trust hearing, and there was some follow-up as a result of the concern you and others have raised. So I know for a fact that that did happen. Yeah, it was four months ago. Right, right. we're in a hiring freeze, we're in a hiring freeze, so we can- Oh, well, historic, historic houses is, is a not-for-profit. They could also raise it the is, money. And they could they could pay for it out of their budget. It's not it's not out of a realm of possibility, I guess. Well, there were some concerns expressed uh, that came out of the hearing, and we did follow up to address them in terms of the budget prices. Uh, under my tenure, like I said, I am very proud of what we were able to do. Our reform still possible, yes. In terms of costs, I want to be very clear. Park does not say to the contractor, no. Don't pay 2,500, raise the price up to 3,400 for a tree. We go out to the market and try to get the best price possible. We have two options. We accept their price or we don't do the work. This is subject to the market. And if we're gonna have a hearing, I would encourage you bring in the building industry to find out why are these prices so high. We work with them. The construction industry are our partners. Uh, we would like to get the lowest prices possible I take no pleasure turning around and saying, this is what a conference station would cost. I would love it if a conference station would cost a million dollars. So there's no intent where Parks is saying, we're out to waste taxpayers' money. No, we wanna make sure we provide something the public will enjoy. We put it out to the market. We get three, four, five bids. We take the lowest responsible bidder, and then we go, out, go forward and start working with them. So I always struggle with this. Sometimes blaming parks is like blaming the, you know, the homeowner for getting a high price from a contractor to remodel the kitchen. We're subject to the market and we will continue to find ways of streamlining the process. We're doing standard design for comfort station and that has been able for us to hold the prices down and not escalate it through doing customized design of our comfort stations and our playground. I'm expired. Commissioner, Commissioner, I think we have to go even further here as to why um, these bids, why contractors are raising their prices because essentially, and I've heard this from several contractors, they don't want to do business with the city because payment is very, very slow. Uh, the job has changed midway multiple times. Uh, the specs are wrong, things are wrong. So I think we need a bigger examination and investigation as to why contractors are holding the city hostage uh, and, 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 and I'd like to know what it costs to, to, uh, to plant a tree uh, in New Jersey parks. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know some comparison is why New York taxpayers are getting soaked. Because you, if you think, and, and you even said 3,400 is too much. Uh, if it is too much, then we need an investigation uh, as to why it's so much more costlier in New York City to plant the tree than across uh, the Hudson River. Uh, I would welcome that conversation. We had a hearing many years ago about the capital process. And so I certainly would welcome that hearing uh, in terms of our contractors. We have over 640. So the contract community uh, wants to do business with the city, over 640 capital projects active right now. Uh, and in terms of change orders, I reduced it by 50 to 70% over my tenure. So we've addressed the change orders. So a lot of what I hear is prior to me getting here, but as the urban myth goes, it carries forward. Uh, but uh, I want to stand up and say how proud I am about what we were able to do in this agency. Things have changed. Well, There's well, no way I would have been able to complete Commissioner, with all due respect, okay, yeah. projects. Commissioner, with all due respect, I've gotten so few trees planted in my district. Under This is the worst it's been since I've been associated with uh, community and parks for over 40 years. I've never seen so few trees being planted in my district, and I and I want some answers. I'm funding uh, uh, additional, uh, putting money uh, from my budget into tree tree pr uh, pruning because I can't get that done. So I understand it's a budget crunch, but way before the the pandemic, we were dealing with this uh, tree problem, and it's not getting solved. It seems. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Yeah. So just to clarify, our hearing on historic houses was actually the first in 15 years. The last one was held in 2005, yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, Commissioner, I'm gonna go to ask a few questions on the capital side. 
uh, as part of the budget agreement, which between mayor and the city council, the fiscal 2021 adopted budget redirects $428 million in capital funds from NYPD to the past department in fiscal 2021 through 2023 for the renovation of recreation and nature centers citywide. So can you please update the committee on how and where this funding has been invested? Um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Nelson, I don't know if you have an update on that. Hi, um, so several projects are moving forward with that funding. Um, Shirley Chisholm Rec Center in Brooklyn is one of them. Um, the second one is the North Shore Recreation Center, which will also be a new recreation center is moving forward with that funding. Um, and Roy Wilkins was allocated $92 million uh, out of that funding. The rest of the funding we're still um, in negotiation um, and discussion with OMB and City Hall as the best use of the funding. As you recall, um, the mayor state of the city in 2020 talked about uh, adding additional recreation centers, but then COVID hit. And so, you know, I think we need to adjust to the new realities in terms of our fiscal situation. So that's been on pause. And I don't know if uh, Deputy Commissioner Braddock wants to add anything to that, but we're very excited to have that funding um, to expand and enhance our recreational facilities for New Yorkers. So in addition to the $428 million we directed from NYPD, the mayor added $65 million in fiscal 2021 for other parks related projects, including when Cortland House Museum uh, renovation, Keith Williams Park, Riverside Park renovation, Marine Park Oval, and citywide, and citywide community gardens. So what is the status of this funding? And has any of the projects commenced uh, uh, construction? Well, let me first ask the top part uh, about some of those specifically. If those capital funds were authorized, everything was placed on pause uh, and then they were phased into start restarting. Uh, so all of those most likely were paused or have, may have started design. I will defer to Commissioner Braddock to see if she has any update, uh, but typically it's about 10 months for design, 10 months for procurement, and then it goes on to construction. So if those projects did move forward, it was very likely paused and is just going to be unpaused by the end of this month. Commissioner Braddock? Yes, thank you, um, Commissioner and Council Member Koo for your question. Um, the commissioner is, is correct that uh, those projects uh, based on when the funding came in were actually then placed on paused a year ago. Um, I know I can tell you at least one, uh, which is Marine Park. That one was uh, started in design. Uh, we're very fortunate that we have a robust in-house design program. And so for projects that could be uh, started with those um, uh, current uh, designers already on staff that they, they were able to continue. I am not sure off the top of my head of the others, but I'm happy to get back to you with, the, with that information. Okay, so please get back to us, yeah. Thank you. So how much has, uh, how much is, how much has been used or allocated of the $428 million? Assuming that we get the full amount, how much is still unallocated? I wanna be clear by your question. When it comes to Shirley Chisholm, that is a design build. Uh, so the project's moving forward. The first phase is design, then procurement, and then construction. On average, it takes about two years or so uh, or plus before you get to construction. So if the money is allocated, uh, you start spending it. If there are design services for those design services, 
until you get to construction. So the projects are now proceeding, but in the case of Shirley Chisholm, that's DDC because that one was a design build. So while the funds are within parks, uh, our, our partner agency is the one that is proceeding and we're taking advantage of the new design bill that was authorized about two years ago. Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, the fiscal 2021 adopted budget includes $138 million in city capital funding for 104 discretionary projects within the parks uh, department citywide. What percent of the fiscal 2021 council funded project projects are in design, bid, or construction? I'm not sure, council member, where the 138 million number comes from, but I can tell you on average, usually we have about 640, 50 projects. It's typically a third in design, a third in procurement, and a third in construction. That's the rule of thumb we generally use. So if you look at our entire capital budget, that's where most of those projects land. Uh, a lot of the construction projects are moving forward. And again, I wanna reiterate uh, that we have a close to a 80 to 9% um, completion on time. And in fact, we're getting more and more projects completed early before COVID. Uh, and in some cases, even during COVID. Uh, right now, we're having challenges with the procurement process because so many have been paused and we're strategically figuring out how do we start moving them forward. But, on, but again, let me reiterate, it's about a third in design, a third in procurement, and a third in construction. So how much funding is allocated for Shirley Chis Home and the other parks? I'll defer to Commissioner Nelson. I don't know the number off the top of my head. I don't want to get it wrong, but uh, yeah. Commissioner Nelson. So, um, so we're still working with DDC to come up with the final number. Um, this was a, a project that started out at a different site at $60 million. Um, it's moved to a new site at Nostrand Playground. Um, and at the uh, request of the local elected officials, we're also adding a indoor pool. So we're working with DDC who will be doing this project to come up with that final number. And that will come out of the that extra money that was that will need to be allocated to increase that project from the original $60 million will come out of that 428. But it will be okay. significantly more than the 60, so. Just want to uh, clarify with the commission, uh, commissioner, the $138 million is how much the council members allocated for capital projects oh. in fiscal 2021. Yeah. I see, I see, okay. Yeah. Yes, uh. so the same remains. Uh, very often there's council money and then there's mayoral money and sometimes there's present money to make a project whole. There are so many across our entire portfolio that would be different to answer, but the same answer applies. Uh, it's about a third in procurement, third in construction, and a third in design. So that number still holds. Uh, as I said before, I know there's a lot. I'll be very clear. There was a concern in the past uh, about the delay in capital projects. I will proudly say it. I'll say it again and again because I have the numbers to prove it. That is no longer the case. We were able to, we inherited 130 stall projects. 101 of them are now completed. Our track record right now is outstanding. We reduced the process, completed over 800 projects. And so uh, as I'll be here another three months or so. Uh, we're committed to keep moving those projects forward now that it's on pause. Those are in constructions. The construction industry is delighted. Our MWBEs are delighted. Uh, and so the public will start seeing more of those projects opening up this spring, this summer, and uh, moving forward. Yeah, thank you. So because I heard so many council members, they are frustrated and upset about their projects not moving forward, you know, like Salamanca right. and other ones, right? right. So, we'll, so please, yeah, please. We'll uh, we will follow up with Salamanca, but they have to yeah. also understand we had a pause. Uh, back in March, everything stopped. Construction, procurement, design. And so our team worked with OMB to start releasing those that were life safety type projects first. They were rolling permissions to start unpausing projects. 
and now all of the projects will be unpaused. That's close to 400 will be unpaused and to start. So we feel the same pain. We just were at a standstill uh, because of the budget crisis. Thank you. So the mayor recently announced commitment of $17, $17 billion in capital spending. How much of that money is going to the parks? There is about uh, the East River Esplanade and 107th Street here, which is something we've been advocating for a very long time, as long as I've been here, uh, has been authorized as part of that package. Uh, I'm trying to get you the exact number, $284 million uh, to do the critical repairs to the East River Esplanade Phase 4 and Pier 107, which is in serious, serious state of disrepair, and portions of that Esplanade are actually just closed. So it's $284 million uh, for this capital budget. Okay. Uh, how much parks projects, the, how many parks projects will be included? And has parks give, uh, that, and has parks been given? Um, I'm unclear about the question. How uh, many, so how many parks projects will be included? Well, right capital now, spending? we have our 10 year capital plan, but in terms of this budget, uh, for now, in terms of the preliminary budget, it's the East River Plan Phase Four and Pier 107 I just mentioned for 284 million. That is the recommendation at this point uh, for the fiscal year 2022 capital budget for parks. Okay, so my last question is: So, can you please give us the status of all City Council funded projects in fiscal 2021? Yeah. We can, my borough commissioners meet with the council members on a regular basis to give an update. Uh, certainly any council member that would like that update, we do it. So we have a tracking system. Uh, I'm not asking uh, the council members to do this, but I'm letting the public know those that are watching, they can always go to our capital tracker. Uh, it is a very transparent uh, website that they can check the status of the project, but we always offer a council member an up-to-date project day project of where it stands. And so I'll offer that to you and I offer that to all the council members should they want to know. So they have been given instructions uh, or guidelines on how to restart, right? Yes. Yeah. We, we have been, yes. Uh, OMB gave us permission to unpause the rest of the projects that have been unpaused. OMB has given us permission during the pandemic. They unpaused uh, tranches of projects uh, and now, as of the end of this month, they're unpausing all the remaining projects. So can you give us a full list of citywide, uh, where city council members uh, funded projects uh, right now? Yeah. Uh, not at this moment, it'd be quite yeah, a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, we can, yeah, you, you we, can we communicate can to us. Little, yes, the answer is we can get you that spreadsheet so you see all the council funded projects, yes. Thank you, Commissioner, yeah. Um, I finish uh, my my uh, all my questions. If we have uh, further questions, we will communicate with you in email. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to also thank you you for your service. You no, know, like other council members already said, you are a gentleman and you are a scholar. You you know we really like you a lot. You no, know, you are really nice, really dedicated public servant. Uh, I wish we had more of you in our administration. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Ku. And yeah. I just want to say, I know council members are tough. I didn't expect any different today, uh, but I know you will care deeply about the park system, care about your constituents, and so I never take it personally. Uh, I just want to just thank my staff and the park workers. My goodness, during COVID, uh, I was moved and amazed by how committed and dedicated they are. I always want to create a culture of both caring and respect which is why I believe I have such a great relationship with all of the unions, because we shared uh, that uh, with our employees. So I wanna thank you. And I do know you have to move now to the next uh, round of those that'll be testifying. So thank you, Chairman Crew. I look forward to working with you in the remaining few months. Yeah, thank you, you and your staff. Yeah, yeah.
wonderful service to to the citizens of New York. Uh, thank, thank Mr. you, Mr. Stefari. Yeah. Yes. Thank before you. Be, yeah. Go before ahead, we go to public participations, can we take a break of like five minutes? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think we can recess for uh, five minutes. Uh, yeah. This, please. Yeah. Okay. Very well. Please, uh, after the five minutes, we will restart with testimony from members of the public. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we are about ready to restart. Uh, I will start calling up panelists from the public who have registered to testify. Before I do so, I'd just like to go over a few instructions. Uh, we'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. As I stated earlier, each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. So please begin once the Sergeant at Arms has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. So please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. At this point, I'd like to invite Adam Ganser to testify. He will be followed by Heather Lubov. Time begins. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yes. Right. My name is Adam Ganser, and I'm the executive director of New Yorkers for Parks. We are the founding member of the Playfair Coalition, which includes over 300 organizations many of whom will testify today. I want to thank Chair Ku and the committees for the opportunity to speak today. We are here to call on the mayor and the city council to play fair now and to restore parks funding. The preliminary budget does not fully fund the positions that were lost. We don't need half measures or percentages of the whole. Restoring $79.8 million as outlined in our submitted testimony is critical to make sure our city's parks are safe, clean, and accessible for all New Yorkers. During the last 12 months, our parks have supported our physical and mental health. They have been the only place we can visit with friends and family outside of our home and where our children can find unfettered joy and hope. Yet, we have been forced to do this in parks that have felt unsafe, unmaintained, and strewed with trash. This didn't need to happen. Mayor de Blasio dealt the Parks Department a crushing blow in 2020, cutting the uh, Parks budget by 14%. That was $84 million, a rounding error in our city's budget, but crippling for our Parks Department. Parks should be drivers of equity. Unfortunately, these cuts have had the most severe impacts on those very communities that have been hardest hit by the pandemic. The budget is a statement of our city's priorities. Our parks have been woefully underfunded for decades. COVID did not create this problem, but it has brought it to a boiling point. With spring just around the corner, let's make sure the city's budget reflects our commitment to equity and the urgency of our parks and open space needs. We look forward to working with the council to play fair now for our parks budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, council member uh, Holden does have a question. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And um, you're right. Uh, even in the best of times, uh, our parks weren't funded properly. And, uh, you know, I've been around uh, in dealing with parks for over 40 years, and I've seen it firsthand that we've never gotten enough. We never got enough for capital. We never got enough for maintenance. And we certainly never got enough for security in, in protecting our investment. And the crushing blow that you mentioned, it was just that, especially coming out of a pandemic, uh, we need our parks and we need them to operate, obviously with the best uh, facilities, uh, the most um, um, advanced technology that we can offer and still we're not doing that. Um, in fact, you heard the, uh, I think if you heard the commissioner uh, or of um, a park say that we're, we only can keep the, the bathroom was open until 3 p.m. in early spring. That's ridiculous. So I want to thank you for um, your your testimony. And um, certainly, um, I think the next mayor has to really fund parks fully uh, if we are to be, a, you know, the, the great city that we're supposed to be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is Heather Luboff, who will be followed by Lynn Kelly. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Heather Lubov. I'm the executive director of City Parks Foundation, and we are a nonprofit organization that leads free sports, arts, and environmental education programs. And we also co-manage Partnerships for Parks, which is a joint program with New York City Parks. All of our programs encourage New Yorkers to use and care for their neighborhood parks. Um, as you all know, and as you've heard from the commissioner, this over this last year, the Parks Department has been relying significantly on volunteers as green responders to help with litter removal, with planting, and with caring for parks. An astounding 584 individual service projects were led by more than 7,000 volunteers. And they were quickly mobilized in this last year because of the existing network that exists of nearly 600 stewardship groups in all 51 council districts that Partnerships for Parks has cultivated for many years. The city's budget cuts are having a detrimental impact on this effort. We've lost 15% of our outreach positions, making it extremely difficult to serve all communities equitably exactly at the time when we're relying so heavily on stewardship groups in under-resourced neighborhoods. The council's own visionary parks equity initiative is also integral to this network by funding training, micro grants, volunteer supplies, and group development activities that sustain groups now and into the future. So in the short term, we stand as a proud member of the Playfair Coalition and we call on the city to recognize parks as the, the essential infrastructure that they are by restoring both parks budget and parks equity initiative cuts and an end to the hiring freeze. To address long-standing inequities, we must rethink the planning and maintenance of our city's parks and open spaces as a comprehensive network and recognize that they are key elements in supporting health, safety, economic, and environmental issues. On a lighter note, as health conditions continue to improve, we fully expect to restart summer stage and other free cultural performances and expand our programs this summer. We look forward to working with the council and the administration on all of these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you very much. Next is Lynn Kelly, followed by Dilsey Ben. Third begins. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Lynn Kelly. Thank you to the members of the council and especially uh, Pat Parks Committee Chair, Councilmember Koo for your leadership and support. It's nice to see you again. Uh, I'm the director, right. executive director of New York Restoration Project. And for 25 years, we've planted trees, renovated gardens, restored parks, and transformed open space in communities all throughout New York City. We often bring private resources to spaces that lack uh, municipal support, and we're fortifying the city's aging infrastructure in this way. Uh, this year, especially, our gardens produced over 90,000 pounds of fresh and free produce to New York City. As you've heard from my colleagues, COVID-19 didn't cause the issue that we have here today with the under-resourcing of parks, but it certainly underscored the inequities. Uh, and has made it more challenging for all of us as organizations operating and stewarding parkland. Um, NYRP is not immune to the impact of the city's austerity measures. We've suffered a dramatic increase of nearly 80% in our public funding, and that's resulted in a direct loss of staff and programming. While this is serious, uh, NYRP will bounce back. But I want you to think for a minute, imagine the impact of an 80% public funding loss to some of the smaller organizations that uh, the, both the council and the administration fund. They're doing yeoman's work in neighborhoods that simply don't have that kind of infrastructure or support. And that's an enormous cut to them. As the representative of the only citywide land conservancy, we operate in all five boroughs and specifically in under-resourced neighborhoods, I'm here to tell you, and I think you know this, the system is not working. Urban green space is a luxury, is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Uh, and we're asking here as a proud member of the Playfair Now Coalition for the city to restore the park's budget and release the $1 billion of frozen capital funds in order to protect our communities and support our city's future. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Next up is Dilsey, uh, Dilsey Ben, followed by Joe Paleo. Time begins. Good afternoon, Chair Koo and members of the Parks Committee. 
Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify. My name is Dilsey Ben. I'm the president of Local 1505, representing close to 1,000 city park workers, also referred to as city CPWs. Primarily in the New York City um, Parks and Recreation Department, my members work in all five boroughs conducting maintenance in all city parks. I would like to thank the speaker, city council and mayor for baseline and the 100 CPWs that we are, we've been fighting for the last seven years. Furthermore, we are thankful for the additional 100 CPW lines added by the speaker and city council in fiscal year 2020. I come before you today to urge the administration to baseline these additional 100 CPW positions so these New Yorkers do not have to worry every year whether or not they will have a job. I've heard from various groups how baseline the CPWs and adding more have improved the condition of many parks throughout the city. We have come so far and need to keep this trend going. Why go backwards? My members are out there in all five boroughs helping maintain our parks that are enjoyed by all New Yorkers and visitors. Furthermore, my members make 1548 to start and it's becoming increasingly difficult to live and raise a family in the city. The city must take a long, hard look at how it can take care of its workforce. As we approach the start of spring, in the next few weeks, there's a lot of work to be done to prepare the parks and ball fields for the millions of people who will be taking strolls and enjoying the warmer weather in the parks. The beautification of parks is important to all New Yorkers as well as the thousands of tourists who visit these areas. Once again, I would like to thank, the, I'd like to thank Speaker um, Johnson, the city council and mayor for baseline my workers, but we need to continue to work and urge baselining of additional 100 um, CPWs in the physical year 2020. In closing, I would also like to wish Commissioner Silver well and would like to thank David Stark for all the work that he's done for my members during, uh, and the members of DC 37. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and I will be happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Next is Joe Polio, followed by Marlena Giga. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, City Council people. Good afternoon, Chair Ku and the rest of the City Council. Um, I'd like to take a moment to um, wish Commissioner Silver um, well in his future endeavors. Uh, thank you for your service. It's been much appreciated. Thank you for bringing in uh, your history of planning uh, to the uh, Parks Department. Okay, I'd like to begin by uh, stating that the, this parks budget is crucial. Uh, we need to not only restore, we need to expand what we've lost. Uh, last year, for the first time, since 1992, we had layoffs. We had 50 urban park rangers laid off at a time when they were needed the most during a pandemic. Now, what these urban park rangers did was these, had these pop-up programs near these park houses where they would teach kids uh, about the park. They would teach them about ecology, history, and they also taught kids on how to use masks during COVID. They were rewarded with layoff notices. We would like to see them all restored. We would like to see uh, I believe we may have lost Mr. Polio. Yeah. Give us one second to try to deal with that. This is uh, Chief Sergeant at Arms. It appears he has dropped out from the Zoom. Okay, then we'll, we'll proceed with the next person. And if he's able to rejoin at some point, we can uh, have Sorry, him am I, speak. Am I, am I oh. back on? I'm so, oh, I yes. apologize. <laughs> my, 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 my apologies for that, for that technical. My apologies for that technical glitch. I'm sorry about that. Um, 
Yeah. So what I what I would like to see. Well, can we proceed to the another person? It appears we lost him again. We will move on to the next person. If he's able to rejoin, we will have him uh, speak at that point. So uh, if Marlena Gega is available, she is up next. And after her, if Mr. Polio is not up by then, uh, Carter Strickland will be up after that. Time starts now. Hi, my, my name is Marlena Giga, and I've been a PEP officer for 20 years. And I've also been a union rep for Local 983 for the last eight years. Um, I've personally seen the devastation uh, on many aspects that the budget cuts have done. Um, the PEP officers and rangers have been cut to numbers where it's impossible for New Yorkers to feel safe in the parks. Um, as we've heard from several council members, um, people are coming to the park to, to do drugs and to do illegal activity. And the Parks Department is responsible for um, the activity, the illegal activity within the parks. The NYPD, they are reactive. So they'll respond after a situation takes place. But our rangers and PEP officers are the, are the ones that are actively patrolling. I wanna make that clear uh, to everybody on this call. Um, and the Parks Department uh, playgrounds and parks have su suffered as well due to the lack of maintenance employees um, that are able to maintain the parks as well. The city seasonal aides that did not get hired last year suffered greatly. I, I can't even tell you the, the amount of calls that we received. The city seasonal aides, they are the backbone for the Parks Department. Parks Department depends on them um, for the seasonal budget to pick up the beaches and the pools um, for the staff that get stepped up to other locations as well. And the city seasonal aides tend to be the older staff and the younger staff from one um, spectrum to the other. And this is their livelihood. And, and it was devastating um, that people were not getting called back for the parks department. And, you know, they suffered and the public suffered as well. So I urge you to All restore right. for the parks. Um, and the parks department is the face of New York City. And, ju and I just want to, one last thing, $3,400 to plant the tree. We have maintenance workers that can do this at a fraction of the cost, should not be outsourced. Thank you. Thank you. It appears that Joe Paleo was able to sign back on, but before we return to him, Council Member Holden does have a question. Great. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you, thank you, Marlena, um, for your uh, for your testimony. And Joe, I know you're you're out there in the field. I hope you're not driving, but the, <laughs> I think you're sitting in the car. Yeah, we can't hear him. But um, I, I just want to bring up the, the whole uh, PEP and the Urban Park Rangers. Um, how many, uh, Marlena, how many uh, PEP officers are we down? Because I, I, I always said if you quadruple the number, it still wouldn't be enough to, to deal with all the issues in parks right now. I mean, we're at the low 300s. That should be for one borough. Exactly. I mean, it's ludicrous. Yeah. You, know, you have people out. Uh, to leave if there's special events once the summertime comes they get stepped up they're deployed to the beaches and the in the pools you may have two officers on patrol for the whole borough it's disgraceful right and especially now with there seems to be some lawlessness or, or just individuals that have now descended on our parks for you name it in fact um, on a nightly basis we have in my district and, and surrounding areas these car clubs that have come in with loudspeakers and they want to entertain the whole borough with their so-called music. But we, we're seeing that um, almost on a nightly basis, especially when the weather gets warmer. So we really need PEP uh, because without them, like you said, the police are, are running to 911 calls. So we really need 
and, and the, the PEP picks up the slack. So Parks Rangers, we desperately need. And to cut these programs or to cut these job descriptions in our seasonal is just a crime. And, and I just want to thank you and Joe. And I know Joe's got to go on, so I'll let him. Um, I think we finally got him back. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Marlena. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Joe Polio, you may re restart. Thank you. Time starts now. Okay, I'm sorry. My my apologies again. But uh, th thank you, um, Councilman Holden. You're absolutely right. We need more parks enforcement officers. We need more urban park rangers. We need more city seasonal aides. And again, we can in-house this work that you talked about with these trees. We have gardeners. We have associate park service workers. We have city park workers that can do the task at a fractional of the cost. Why are we relying and being held hostage by contractors? It makes no sense. Uh, we, we, I mean, these are long overdue projects. We can do a lot of stuff out there that contractors are doing at overinflated prices. So again, uh, last time uh, we met at city council, we were talking about expansions, you know, uh, everything looked great. Unfortunately, COVID hit and when people needed parks the most, we had the least to offer and made conditions uh, almost unbearable. Uh, we, we, we applaud all those people that volunteered their time to come out and clean the parks, but that is not the solution to this problem. The solution is hire more park workers to do the job, especially now. Not everybody has the luxury of going out to the Hamptons to escape what's happening in the city. Most of us have to rely on our parks and we need them the most. And that's the only place that our children and our seniors are going to have you know, for a green space. Thank you all. I appreciate uh, all of you for giving me this time and I hope we do the right thing this year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Carter Strickland, who will be followed by Christina Taylor. Your time starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chairperson Ku and members of the committee. My name is Carter Strickland. I am the New York State Director of the Trust for Public Land. We're a national nonprofit that creates parks and protects land for people. Uh, I want to thank the Parks Department for getting through a really difficult year and thank Commissioner Silver uh, in particular for his service um, for the people of New York. Since the beginning of the pandemic, parks and open spaces have been critical gathering spaces for New Yorkers. And I will say in response to a recent Nicholas Kristof article, it's one of the few departments that's committed to providing any bathrooms for New Yorkers. Um, after the pandemic, parks will continue to enhance property values and boost economic development. Um, support local jobs and uh, increase spending. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the Trust for Public Land, thanks to generosity of private funders and the New York Green Relief and Recovery Fund, is launching a study of the annual economic benefits of parks in New York City. We hope to have that ready by the next budget season for this council's uh, uh, consideration. Unfortunately, the FY22 preliminary budget uh, indicates that parks are even lower priority than last year. Uh, I note that it's 0.57% uh, of the overall city budget compared to last year's 0.59%. Uh, it doesn't go far enough to restore last year's cuts. We're a proud member of the Playfair Now Coalition and urge the council to restore um, uh, $80 million in the expense budget. Um, I do, we, I'll be spending, submitting some longer testimony on capital budget, but I do wanna say uh, on the council now could expand park access by restoring custodial funding for community playgrounds. Um, that has not kept pace with the funding that council, member, um, council members have spent on our partnership to create open uh, community playgrounds at schools. We need to keep them open. It's about $61,000 for the custodians to keep it open. There's approximately one and a half million dollars uh, you know, to keep open 28 playgrounds that are built and not open because of uh, custodial funding cuts. So uh, with that, thank you, Council. Thank you. Next is Christina Taylor, who will be followed by Carlo, Carlos Castell Crook. Time starts now. Good morning, 
Ms. Taylor, can you, can you pause for one second? There's uh, some uh, issues we're having with your mic or sound. Um, give us one second. Can you restart now? Are you... Good morning, can you hear me now? now? Uh, sorry, it's, is there, is there, there might be an issue on your end. We're getting a lot of feedback um, sound coming from your, I think it's coming from your end. Uh, there's still some distortions coming on. Okay, can I try um, maybe? Oh, it's a little bit it's it better. A little, it's a bit better now, yes. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully right. okay. Yes. Please go All ahead. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, good morning. I'm Christina Taylor, Director of Programs and Operations for the Van Cortland Park Alliance. I've worked in Van Cortland Park for 20 years, but I've never seen a summer like the summer of 2020. In early April, I went to Van Cortland Park for a social distance hike on a day off. For my first big adventure outside, I picked a remote trail that is usually empty, but it was full of people. This is when I realized what kind of summer we were in for. And I was right, as the weather got warmer, Van Cortland Park got busier. Just as the park was overtaken with more visitors than ever before, we learned about the $84 million budget cut to New York City parks. With that cut came the reality that there would be no seasonal staff hired to maintain the park. New York City parks usually receives 1,700 seasonal staff. Last summer, Van Cortland Park got none. And yet twice as many people meant twice as much garbage, twice as much damage to our infrastructure, twice as much tear, wear and tear to the fields and trails, all with half as many staff. And it wasn't just Van Cortland Park, it was happening in every park all over the city. Van Cortland Park Alliance stepped up and helped. We secured funding for six seasonal maintainers and we hosted volunteer days. Park staff worked endlessly. They came at 5 a.m. daily to clean up the mess from the night before. People worked through breaks and late into the evening. Honestly, I don't know how they were standing at the end of the day. And here we are a year later, bracing ourselves for the summer of 2021, which will be just as busy as last year, which is why we need your support in increasing the Parks Department budget to 1% of the city's overall budget. Right now, the Parks Department budget is only 0.5% of the city's budget, which is basically a rounding error. We are asking now for 1% for parks. Is that too much to ask for an agency that serves 8 million New Yorkers providing equitable access to all? Forcing New York City parks to go through another summer with a greatly reduced number of seasonals and no resources is just cruel. Not only has park staff worked tirelessly and in most cases thanklessly, working class field staff have been hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic themselves. And yet they persist, providing a clean and safe environment for the public who is so desperately need our parks. Park workers are the unsung heroes of the pandemic. By increasing the park's budget to 1% of the city's budget, you have the opportunity to thank them for their hard work and to provide cleaner, safer, and more welcoming green spaces for a city that desperately needs it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Council Member Holden did have a question either for you, Christina, or a prior uh, witness. Yes, uh, thank you. My question was, to, uh, or a statement, and maybe both, uh, to uh, Carter Strickland from the Trust for Public Land. I want to thank him for bringing up the schoolyards to playground um, program, which is stalled uh, because of the lack of custodial funding, which is a very minor part of this. We've invested so much in capital, and yet to, to break the promise uh, that we could provide more playgrounds for our, our uh, kids and, and, and everyone, seniors, everyone, but certainly our children coming off of uh, being, uh, you know, obviously quarantined for almost a year now um, is criminal that, we, that we're not even releasing that uh, or funding the custodial area of this, the component. Um, so I want to thank you for bringing it up, even though that they, you know, the administration tried to say that they're 
they're going to fix it. They haven't fixed it yet. And it's and and uh, and Carter, it's not that much money, right? It's, we're not talking about a great deal of money to fund the custodial part of it. Can you unmute uh, Carter Strickland? Thanks. Okay, I'm unmuted now. No, you know, are are we? There's 28 sites in the pipeline, uh, Councilmember Holden. Uh, it's about a million and a half dollars to open up 28 new community playgrounds. Um, you know, serving tens of thousands of people. All right. So it's really that part of it. Uh, you're not talking about much money, you know, relative to the whole city budget. And we can open up so many parks, additional parkland for everyone. So that this needs to be a priority of this administration. And uh, hopefully we uh, as council members can make this, um, you know, uh, a huge part of the, um, the negotiations in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Carter. Thanks for all the great work you guys do. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have to concur with Council Member Holden about uh, the problem uh, of custodian. Now, uh, we have received many complaints uh, in our school, uh, School 189. Uh, we have an, uh, a nice playground built by Carter, uh, but they cannot use it due to custodian uh, problems. So we want to uh, ask the Council uh, we together we show solidarity uh, to tell DOE to open up those playgrounds. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Next, uh, next person is Carlos Castel Croke, who will be followed by Dan Clay. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castel Croak, and I am the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Ku and all the council members on the committee for the opportunity to testify today. NYLCV supports a fiscal year 2020, uh, sorry, 2022 budget. Uh, that secures progress on many of the environmental, transportation, and public health priorities Mayor de Blasio has committed to in one NYC and beyond. Our city is on the precipice of the road to recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is incumbent on our, upon our elected leaders to invest our tax dollars in climate action and solutions as we rebound from this crisis and not lose ground, especially with the influx of relief funds that will flow from the American Rescue Act package. New York City's Department of Parks and Recreation plays a critical role in this fight. Parks and green spaces are one of the city's most valuable environmental assets and are a major source of the city's urban canopy, which mitigates climate change, provides clean air and habitats for native wildlife, and contributes to the well being of our residents and economy. Preserving these spaces is a top priority for NYLCV. The 2.6 million street and park trees that the Parks Department is responsible for remove 1,300 uh, 1, tons of pollutants from the atmosphere and store 1 million tons of carbon each year. Trees are vital for mitigating urban heat highland effect and can lower temperatures by up to nine degrees, cutting air conditioner use by 30% and reducing heat energy use by a further 20 to 50%. This is why NYLCV is proud to join with the New Yorkers for Parks and DC 37 again as founding members of the Play for, for Parks campaigns. Parks not only provide critical infrastructure that have multiple environmental benefits, but they also offer a place for New Yorkers to safely social distance, exercise and get much needed fresh air. But over the past year, through the hardships of the pandemic, we have seen the cleanliness and safety of our parks drop significantly due to unfair budgetary cuts to staffing and programs. With the summer months coming, parks are poised to see a sharp uptick in usership after having been neglected for months. That's why in the third year of our campaign, we're asking for the $78.9 million uh, in the fiscal 2020 uh, parks budget, um, which I will uh, outline all of our specific asks in uh, the testimony that I submit. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Chris, is Mr. Uh, is Carter still on? I, I forgot to ask him the question. Uh, I believe he might have signed off council member. Uh, um, he doesn't appear to be listed any longer. Okay, so yeah. Okay, we'll call the next person who is uh, uh, Dan Clay, who will be followed by Joanna Altman-Smith. Time starts now. 
Hi there, everybody. Yeah, Dan Clay is my name. I'm a gardener for Parks, the one gardener in, in Prospect Park in Brooklyn and president of the uh, Gardeners Local 1507 of East 37. And first, let me just say thanks to everybody here, everybody for your concern and your, your uh, and your support, everybody from the city council and Parks and Rec and DC 37 especially. And um, I just want all the two things I wanted to say is, first of all, hopefully everybody is appreciating nature and, and understanding that this, this major blow we've been dealt this year from nature, I'm talking about the virus and, and the fact that nature is like one of the, one of the best things to help make things a, a little better, you know, the, the parks and, and their, uh, and their uh, and people's you know people having the parks to visit while they're uh, suffering and everything. And I hope also that uh, everybody's on board with uh, getting things back to normal. And and I want everybody to know that we we just want to all of us gardeners and everybody all the boots on the ground in the parks. We want to get back to doing some good work, and um, hopefully things are better soon. So uh, thanks for uh, hosting this event and. And uh, thanks again for all your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Joanna Altman Smith, followed by Emily Maxwell. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joanna Altman Smith. I am testifying today as a professional citizen, but I'm a member of many of the organizations that are on the Play Fair Coalition. I serve on Community Board 6 in Brooklyn as well on the Parks Committee and others. And I also sit on Prospect Parks uh, Community Committee. Uh, this year, more than ever, New Yorkers loved our New York City parks to death. This might sound like hyperbole, but despite the valiant efforts of parks employees and dedicated volunteers, our parks have suffered damage due to maintenance and operational limitations from which it will take years and major reinvestments to recover. This simply is not a fiscally sound approach to budgeting. And that's what we're here to discuss today. I'd like to share a couple of examples from Prospect Park, which is my local park. At the same time, we celebrated major capital projects like the new entrances on Flatbush and the restoration of Endale Arch, it's gorgeous. Another popular entrance to the park at Garfield Place and Prospect Park West has been severely neglected. The rustic pathways that comprise this entrance are often impassable due to lack of snow removal and muddy conditions for much of the year. People eager to access the Long Meadow and the Park Drive have compacted the soil and destroyed the landscape in a wide radius around the approved pathways. Any savings on maintenance has devastated the physical integrity of the entire area. Similarly, the decrease in PEP, um, we heard from other council members about some things that are happening in other parks. What it looks like in Prospect Park to not have enough enforcement is that dog owners let their pets off leash in our delicate and unique woodlands ecosystems, damaging wildlife and flora, fauna. Uh, treasure hunters with metal detectors freely destroy the long meadow and open campfires are built. I see my Spot. time's running out. So I just wanted to emphasize that uh, we need to, um, we need to focus on restoring the expense budget um, back to a full $79.8 million and that everything we invest in our open space, our urban canopy, our natural areas will be returned to us many fold in uh, savings for public health and environmental benefits. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next is Emily Maxwell followed by Anna Boatwright. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Emily Maxwell. I'm the director of the city's program for the Nature Conservancy in New York. And we have over 35,000 members and supporters here in New York City. Um, I don't wanna reiterate all of the incredible things my colleagues have said. I think it's clear that we're all here to ask city council to help us play fair for parks um, and the Nature Conservancy fully supports that. I wanna enumerate a few slightly complimentary things because I know we're all here with the same sort of mission. Um, so one of the things I would like to emphasize is that New Yorkers don't have equitable access to our parks. And 
even if people can access a park, they may not feel that the amenities or the cleanliness or their safety is the same. And some recent research by the New School and the Nature Conservancy and others really underscores this. And particularly in some of our communities, as in Queens and Brooklyn that were hardest hit by COVID, we see people feeling that inequitable access. So parks and our trees are a critical part of our COVID recovery. And I wanna note that our budget for trees as underscored by some of the conversations that have been taking place during this hearing is the lowest it's been in about 16 years. That's really scary. Our trees provide critical services for New Yorkers from cleaner air to cooler streets to shade when we need to be outside on hot summer days in the face of increasing heat. And having an adequate budget for trees, both existing maintenance and new is crucial for the future and health of New Yorkers and for our economic recovery. I'll also just highlight that nature-based jobs for New Yorkers are more important than ever. We need healthy, safe, well-paying jobs for folks to be maintaining our city and improving quality of life for others. And we also need to be providing support for those who steward, many of the nonprofits who steward our parks that complement the work of the city itself. Um, my longer testimony will be in writing. I just want to underscore that increasing and restoring the budget for New York City parks and our trees is really crucial for the city's recovery. And the Nature Conservancy is happy to be with you all today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next is Anna Boatwright, followed by Sarah Charlotte Powers. Time starts now. Hello, uh, thank you for your time this afternoon. My name is Anna Boatwright, and I am a board member at the Fort Greene Tennis Association, a nonprofit in Brooklyn. We have over a thousand constituents, and we have raised over $100,000 over the past decade to help maintain the tennis courts at Fort Greene Park. I'm here today to talk about tennis in parks across the city and how the parks department budget plays a vital role in making the sport accessible to all New Yorkers. New York City Parks provides access to nearly 600 tennis courts across the city. Tennis is a COVID safe sport and has seen a surge in participation. In Fort Greene, local residents line up at sunrise in hopes to reserve one hour of court time. From July through December last year, more than 7,500 hours of tennis were played on our six courts. Budget cuts meant that the tennis courts did not have a park staff attendant who is typically responsible for ensuring that the courts are utilized in a fair and equitable manner. Our volunteer association stepped in to help as much as possible but the combination of increased demand and lack of park staff led to a reduction in equal access to tennis. Similar patterns were true at other park locations. According to Charles East, head of the Lincoln Terrace Tennis Association, Lincoln Terrace Park saw court usage until midnight on a regular basis. Mark McIntyre, executive director of the Riverside Clay Tennis Association in Manhattan reports, his facility was in constant use every court. However, because parks provided no attendant at the 119th Street courts, many courts were occupied by the same players hour after hour, and so many others who wanted to play could not get on. Daniel Carson of Astoria Park in Queens told us this summer it was common to wait up to two hours or more for an open court. The evidence is clear. People are in dire need for regular participation in healthy active outlets like tennis, is my time up? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, with so many new players getting engaged with the sport, demand will remain high for years to come. Funding for parks needs to be rebuilt and supported and the dramatic of events of 2020 have only made this more clear. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Next is Sarah Charlotte Powers followed by Mike Resney. Time begins. Um, hi everyone, my name is Sarah Charlotte Powers. I'm the Executive Director of the Natural Areas Conservancy. Thanks to Council Member Ku and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Our organization, the Natural Areas Conservancy, works as a close partner to the Parks Department to advance the restoration and management of 10,000 acres. That's a third of our city's park system um, that are forests and wetlands. 
a signature project of our organization was the development with the agency of the forest management framework for New York City, which was released in 2018 and calls for the comprehensive management of over 7,000 acres of forest land on city parks property and includes a detailed set of metrics and a budget for the next 25 years. We were thrilled in 2019 by the leadership of the council and the mayor, which resulted in $43 million of expense funding, including $4 million to support the management of forested natural areas. This funding was used to implement the first year of recommendations of the forest management framework, and our colleagues at the Parks Department were incredibly efficient with the use of these funds. They employed 47 seasonal staff, planted over 20,000 trees and shrubs, engaged 2,000 volunteers, improved 40 miles of trails, and cared for over 900 acres of parkland in under 12 months using this expense funding. The plight of our city's natural areas has mirrored that of the full park system over this past year. Visitation to natural areas increased 65% between 2019 and 2020. And at the same time, the agency's ability to care for this third of the park system has been drastically impacted due to budget cuts and the loss of more than 50 seasonal staff. Another significant challenge is the impact of the hiring freeze, which has left positions empty for the past year. Um, we stand in support of the play, play fair, calling for the reinstatement of funds that were cut from the agency's budget and look forward to working together with our colleagues to care for parks in the year ahead. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mike Resney, followed by Amy Harrison Thog Martin. Time begins. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the Parks Committee for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Mike Resney, and I'm the Assistant Director of Green Space at Grow NYC. Uh, Grow NYC has one simple goal to make our city more sustainable and livable through environmental programming that empowers communities block by block. Our work in New York City has increased access to fresh, affordable food in under-resourced communities, built and revived open green spaces, diverted waste from landfills, and educated the next generation of environmental leaders. Grow NYC interacts with the city's parks and parkland in two main ways. First, many of our green market farmers markets are hosted on NYC Parks property, and we're proud that these green market locations remained open and serving residents throughout the pandemic. This includes not just our best known markets like Union Square and Grand Army Plaza, the green markets in Poe Park, Corona Park, Inwood Hill Park, and many more neighborhoods throughout the city. The second way is through the program that I run, Grow NYC's Green Space Program. Since our founding in 1970, Grow NYC has built more than 135 community gardens across New York City. Later this year, these garden projects will exceed 1 million square feet of open green space. In 2020, we built 10 new gardens in Brownsville, Bushwick, Canarsie, Cypress Hills, East New York, Greenpoint, Castle Hill, Fordham Heights, Morrisania, and Jamaica. In addition to those 10 new gardens, Grow NYC completed renovation projects at 30 additional sites. The majority of this garden work takes place at Green Thumb Community Gardens, and we're incredibly grateful for our partnership with the Green Thumb team. In addition to these gardens, a meaningful portion of the gardens we build have been built in non-park spaces a dozen gardens on NYCHA property, several publicly accessible community gardens on church property, and a community garden on a landmark historic cemetery in Woodside. Searching for non-traditional garden locations allows us to reach more New Yorkers and to turn unused vacant land into garden spaces designed alongside the community. I'm and of course, course, it allows Grow NYC to do valuable work in council districts that do not necessarily include Green Thumb Community Gardens. A uh, critical source of funding is discretionary funding, including Parks Equity and a Greener NYC, and we stand with the Playfair Coalition and ask that these programs be restored. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Harrison Thug Martin, who will be followed by Caroline Susloff. Time begins. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak today and for your continued leadership. I am Amy Thogmartin and serve on the board of the Marine Park Alliance and am providing this testimony on behalf of the organization. 
At 798 acres, Marine Park is the largest city property in Brooklyn. And as is true and has been heard today from uh, for all city parks, use has dramatically increased during the pandemic. We're delighted to see more people discover our park, but there are challenges with that as well. The four major issues that were previously challenges pre-pandemic have been exacerbated by it. One is garbage. With increased use, our tonnage of litter has also increased significantly. We've also seen an uptick of illegal construction debris dumping in our park. Two, the ecology. Because the nature trails are more crowded than ever, visitors walk off trail, trampling plantings and creating new and harmful pathways. This has been especially destructive near the Salt Marsh Nature Center, reversing the success of a multi-year, multi-million dollar program to stabilize the ecology. Three, staffing. We need a full restoration of park staffing. Marine Park has only, dedica only eight dedicated staff members, while significantly smaller Brooklyn parks have more staff to cover less acreage. Additionally, Marine Park lost its full-time supervisor without explanation and suffers for it. Volunteers and hiring teens for summer jobs are in inadequate replacements for the full-time staff. Four, private support. Large volunteer groups and corporate funding have been cut due to the pandemic and other competing priorities. These sources of labor and funding were critical to the upkeep of, of Marine Park and are sorely missed. Numerous studies have shown that parks are essential to the mental and physical health of urban communities. We must restore the full parks department budget to support the healing power of parks throughout the city now and in the future. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Caroline Susloff, followed by Jennifer Wainwright. Time begins. Good morning. My name is Caroline Susloff, and I'm a legal fellow in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. NILPI works with communities across the New York City area, providing support and services to combat inequalities, injustices, and infringements on civil rights. Our environmental justice program has advocated and litigated on the subject of the inequities of the distribution of environmental burdens and benefits in our city for almost three decades. Thank you to Chair Ku, the committee members here today and the council for providing opportunity to testify today. I am pleased to be here representing NILPI in our EJ program to support community members from the St. Albans neighborhood and community board 12 Queens in their efforts to secure funding for the departments of parks and recreation to develop and maintain two parcels of land adjacent to Brinkerhoff Avenue as parks. The city has neglected these parcels for decades despite re repeated pleas from the community for them to be properly maintained. We share the community's vision of transforming this land from an eyesore filled with illegal dumping into vibrant green space. In order to bring this vision to life, NILPI has been working closely with community representatives from the community board 12, and the Alpha Streets Block Association, as well as the Trust for Public Lands. Funding this proposed park is an issue of environmental justice. St. Albans is and long has been a community of color and contends with a long and frustrating history of being underserved and overburdened by the city. For example, Community Board 12 has been the third most overburdened community district in the city for decades in terms of how much garbage is processed in the district. Meanwhile, it is home to very few parks or playgrounds. St. Albans deserves equitable access to green space and the benefits and remedies that quality parks convey. Studies have demonstrated that access to high quality green space improves community health outcomes and the community's need for additional parkland has only taken on greater urgency during the pandemic. The community is asking the committee for a minimal capital investment and minimal continued investment. The land in question is already home to grass and trees, we are simply asking for light landscaping, routine maintenance, and the removal of fencing surrounding one of the parcels. Um, thank you. DPR already cuts the grass, but only occasionally on an inconsistent basis as a courtesy. Including this work in their budget would ensure that DPR understands that regular maintenance is their obligation. Um, Nilpi is grateful for that New York City Parks Commissioner Silver, Queens Parks Commissioner Dockett, and Council Member Denise Miller have all expressed support for this project in the past. And we ask that this committee follow their leadership and allocate funding for the project in the fiscal year 2022 budget. Thank you to all of you for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jennifer Wainwright, followed by uh, Christine Dates Romero. Time begins. 
Good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the committees. My name is Jennifer Wainwright and I'm the communication manager for the Randalls Island Park Alliance, RIPA. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Due to COVID, like many of our sister conservancies, our operating budget took an enormous hit. We furloughed staff, cut budgets, and creatively restructured, all while the park saw record-breaking use, especially from neighboring communities in East Harlem and the South Bronx. Cuts to funding for parks have created additional challenges due to the increased usage in park land. This placed an added burden on RIPA's already reduced resources as we work to pick up the slack. There was also a stop on procurements or for even basic OTPS needs. With increased usage and parks department cuts, RIPA seeks support to upgrade pathways which have seen more visitors than ever along with general programmatic support to keep the park active, clean and safe. It is crucial that the New York City Council fight to restore funding for the Parks Department and continue to supplement this funding through expense funding such as the Parks Equity Initiative and in support of capital projects. COVID has shown us the critical need for our open spaces and public parks. New Yorkers have come increasingly to depend upon free, safe, clean outdoor spaces for recreation, relaxation and exercise. With sufficient upkeep, public spaces can and should provide a safe space where all New Yorkers can take a break and come together, an essential resource serving our most basic well-being. New York City Parks Department funding should be not only restored, but in fact expanded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Datramero, followed by Ali Ryan. I begin. Give us one second, uh, uh, Christine, while we just try to unmute you. There you go, please begin. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, my name is Christina Dutz Romero and I'm the executive director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Um, we have been the steward for East River Park for the last 22 years. And uh, as such, I want to um, testify today uh, we have seen this park newly renovated in uh, late 2012 um, and the landscape could not be maintained with the resources that were allocated because we only have one gardener for a 59 acre uh, waterfront park and millions of dollars in capital money was basically um, wasted because um, uh, there were no resources here to really maintain this park and that was in a good year. Uh, Parks has really suffered from structural underfunding for decades now. Uh, with the budget impacts due to COVID-19, a perfect storm was created and seasonal staff, PEP, urban parks rangers and natural resource group all suffered staff reduction by parks and our open spaces were used more than ever. <clears throat> we stand firm with the Playfair coalition and urge the city council to restore parks funding to pre-pandemic levels and we would like to see a commitment to allocate one percent of the city budget to parks in the future once we uh, we have a more robust uh, uh, budget to really dedicate resources to parks has so many vital functions for new yorkers gathering spaces access to recreational spaces and natural areas and with the escalating climate crisis parks must also play a crucial role in fighting climate change we are calling on parks to embrace their responsibility for better management of their yard and er organic waste and to embrace expert organizations such as the Lower East Side Ecology Center to, ass to assist in implementing composting programs. We have partnered with parks for the last 23 years to do just that. And now the composting program is facing eviction from East River Park without much transparency why parks came to this decision. Parks That's needs fine. to be improved their sustainability practices and embrace partnerships with community-based organizations that have the knowledge and education to get this job done. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ali Ryan, who will be followed by Sarah Williams. Time begins. Hello, my name is Ali Ryan and I'm a member of East River Park Action and Metro Area Governor's Island Coalition. But today I am representing myself as a parent who lives in Alphabet City. 
First, on behalf of my children and their friends, I want to thank former council member Rosie Mendez and current council member Carlina Rivera, as well as the Parks Department for renovating several playgrounds in my neighborhood, most recently Sawyer Park. As a parent, I can attest families use these parks every day. I was going to talk about the Parks Department Youth Sports Program, East River Park, and Governor's Island, but I will address them in my written testimony. Yesterday afternoon, my young daughters were playing with their friends at First Park Playground at the corner of Houston and First Avenue. While playing, the children discovered a dead rat and attempted to move the dead rat until I intervened. I called 311 and requested that the rat be removed. The 311 representative told me that the rat would be removed within 10 days by members of the park by a member of the parks department. This is not the first time that my children encountered a dead rat at a playground, but this is the first time I've been told that it would take up to 10 days for a dead animals removal. For families, pu public parks are our communal backyards. I think I can speak for the neighbor, sorry, I think I can speak for the parents in my neighborhood when I say I am grateful to the parks department workers who work diligently to keep our public playgrounds clean. Please restore the public, um, the parks department budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Williams, followed by Faye Hill. Time begins. Thank you. I'm Sarah McCollum Williams, Executive Director of Green Gorillas, a nonprofit that supports community gardeners and activates youth engaged in food justice across the city. Special thanks to Council Members Ayala, Gibson, Cabrera, Eugene, Cornegy, and then Council Member Torres, and also many of the Council Members present at this hearing today who have been strong supporters of community gardens. During fiscal year 2020, Council Members across the Bronx and Brooklyn had allocated $155,000 of discretionary funds for our work with community gardens through the Parks Equity Initiative and through Greener New York, but largely through Parks Equity. This year, we have been allocated less than 40,000 due to cuts to Parks Equity Initiative. As a lean and efficient organization, Green Gorillas was able to act quickly in March of 2020, as soon as the pandemic hit. With last year's Parks Equity Initiative funds, we were able to provide immediate and direct support in the form of seeds, seedlings, lumber, soil, tools, and personal protective equipment to community gardeners who were redoubling their efforts to grow food for their communities. Communities that were already experiencing food insecurity before COVID-19 are now depending on community gardens to survive. Community gardeners are continuing their food production efforts during the 2021 growing season, many of them ramping up their growing capacity for distribution to families, neighbors, and local organizations in need, sometimes uniting with other gardens uh, to distribute across large networks. Unfortunately, due to cuts in parks equity initiative funding, which has greatly diminished our funding from the city, our capacity to assist these gardeners in their vital community work is likewise greatly diminished. We join with our colleagues in the Playfair Coalition to urge the city to restore full funding for the Parks Equity Initiative after last year's budget cuts. Further, we ask the city to increase their support for community gardens as essential infrastructure for neighborhood food production, rest and respite, and great environmental benefit, and to offer community affirming funding to ensure that they can continue to enrich communities across the city. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Faye Hill, will be followed by Jordan Hyden. Time begins. Uh, good afternoon, New York City elected officials and our chair, uh, Chairman Koo. My name is Faye Hill, a resident of Springfield Gardens and district leader for Assembly 31 Bean Queens. As a retired uh, executive legal secretary, I'm also the executive director secretary for volunteers for Springfield Park in Queens, a member of community board 13 and chairperson for the parks 
and the Environment Committee for the past eight years. I'm here to testify on behalf of the communities as a whole and to thank our New York parks on the remarkable work they have contributed to our communities. These are hardworking leaders who have contributed to the awareness and the improvement of our parks and green spaces in New York City. I would like to also take a pause to our former councilman, Donovan Riches, who made it possible to, to the budget for the parks in Southeast Queens and the Far Rockaway for the past six years and have done a, a major improvement to our parks and hope to continue to do so. I live in, in Springfield Gardens for over 40 years and I've seen our parks deteriorated, prostitution, drug invest, infested and our, and our residents were unable to use their parks in both Springfield Gardens and Rosedale and surrounding communities during the city's council administration during the, their budget session. We were totally ignored for many years. The upper respiratory and asthma disease have increased. And if we do not have trees and green spaces for our residents, we continue to suffer. I am pleading to the budget committee to be, to, to be fair with parks. Now our parks are somewhat improved and the quality of life has become a part of for our residents to enjoy their parks. We need more funding where we can hire more parks workers, park patrol and maintenance and the upkeep of our parks so we continue to enjoy them. I must draw your attention again to the pandemic we are now facing and the emphasis on how our parks are open and being used on a record basis. The past year our park did not have enough spaces to accommodate residents all over the city. The park where our board members That's strive correct. to keep clean because of lack of park workers was used in a breaking, uh, breaking capacity during 2020. Funding is imperative to award to our parks for our city residents to enjoy relaxation, also enjoy the quality of life. Thank you for listening. I have more to say, and I'm going to miss uh, Commissioner Silver, and uh, I hope all, all the best. Thankful, thank you, respectfully submitted, Faye D. Hill. Thank you. Next, our next speaker is Jordan Hyden, who will be followed by Mike Schnoll. Time begins. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jordan Hyden, and I represent Gowanus Canal Conservancy, a nonprofit organization dedicated to facilitating the development of a resilient, vibrant open space network centered on the Gowanus Canal. And thank you for providing the opportunity to submit testimony. Today, I am urging the City Council to prioritize the long-term health and sustainability of our city by restoring the Parks Equity Initiative and last year's drastic budget cuts to New York City parks. Through this pandemic, our parks, natural areas, street trees, and gardens have been essential, providing New Yorkers with comfort, connection, exercise, and respite. In a neighborhood like Gowanus, where combined sewer overflow, street flooding, and urban heat island are everyday occurrences, Parks, street trees, and other green infrastructure soak up stormwater to reduce flooding and sewage overflow, shade and cool our streets, and reduce air pollution. In Gowanus, 670 young trees and 30 rain gardens installed over the past decade provide ecosystem services that make the neighborhood more livable and resilient, especially in times of crisis. Last year's budget cuts also significantly impacted the Parks Equity Initiative, which supports GCC programs such as the Gowanus Tree Network which helped to fill gaps in the Parks Department's capacity to care for young street trees, engaging more than 1,000 volunteers and students annually in the stewardship of street trees, parks, and gardens throughout the Gowanus neighborhood. GCC stands strongly with our partners in the Playfair Coalition to ensure future budget planning prioritizes essential maintenance, job creation, and security for frontline park workers and funding for nonprofit stewardship activities to support this valuable infrastructure. In this time of crisis, it is more important than ever to protect essential infrastructure and support a resilient and equitable city. I sincerely thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Schnoll, followed by Angel Hernandez. Time begins. Good afternoon, Chair Ku. My name is Mike Schnoll, and I'm a candidate for the New York City Council, rep running to represent the 49th Council District covering the North Shore of Staten Island. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. As a proud alumnus of the New York City Council, first serving in the Council Finance Division and then a legislative director for a member 
I'm really proud to be here today. I also served almost 10 years in New York City parks and have attended and testified at over 50 committee and budget hearings, so I feel everyone's pain today. I'm testifying today in support of every effort the New York City Council can possibly make to provide funding to protect, preserve, enhance, and care for our precious parks and open space. I support the Playfair Now campaign, which was prescient in its efforts in 2019, recognizing that parks and open space would be, unknowingly to many of us, the mental health oases we needed to persevere through the pandemic. I support every effort to maintain and enhance staffing levels so the care and operation needed to maintain our parkland becomes a priority for the city that has historically disinvested in the needs of our Emerald Empire. Parks are more important than ever to our health and well being, and the Council will hopefully not just support the agency, but also the dozens and dozens of parks related nonprofit conservancies and friends of groups that pour their blood, sweat and tears into keeping our parks clean, green and healthy and safe. I just want to say that I am deep, while I am deeply sad that Parks Commissioner Silver is leaving, I had the pleasure to work with him and for him before leaving the agency and have come to respect his empathic approach to caring for parks, his visionary leadership on remaking parks for communities neglected for decades, and his commitment to equity and equality for all across a vast and diverse park system. I uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next is Angel Hernandez, followed by Alexandra Unthank. Time begins. Hello, Chairman Ku and members of the committee. My name is Angel Hernandez. I'm Director of Government Relations for the New York Botanical Garden, NYBG. Thank you for allowing me to testify today on behalf of the Cultural Institutions Group, CIG, a coalition of 44 <laughs> cultural arts and science organizations located in all five boroughs and collectively welcome visits from millions of New York City public school children and residents. Many CIG members like NYBG, along with other partnering outdoor living museums, such as the Bronx and Staten Island zoos, Queens and Brooklyn Botanic Gardens and Snug Harbor are all located on parkland. Operating on these grounds allows us to continue our great work to serve our communities while continuing endeavors in the sciences and environmental preservation for unique fauna and flora. Since COVID-19 attacked our city last year, these institutions have provided free access to our city residents, served as meal distribution sites, and distributed PPE to members of their communities in need. CIG living museums have contributed to the public life, public health, and public service of all New Yorkers throughout the pandemic. I'd like to focus on NYBG's commitment to public health. In a time when social distancing and a need of reprieve from quarantine, NYBG immediately offered safe open space since last year. Since then, we received over 300,000 visitors, over 100,000 of those offered at no cost to Bronx residents and healthcare workers. During our shutdown last year, our staff immediately addressed the growing food insecurity in the Bronx by donating over 300 ton tons of fresh produce to local food relief organizations and public schools. Also, we began to offer technical assistance and donated tens of thousands of seedling plants to local community gardens, such as Bissell and River Run Gardens in City Council District 12, in effort to create food hubs so that they can feed their respective communities. Yet our efforts in continuing the work will be hampered if CIG funding for FY22 is compromised. We continue to operate on limited capacity Understanding that city funds have been reallocated towards efforts to fight COVID-19, the CIG group, along with its members' outdoor living museums, would just only ask that cultural budget be held harmless and maintained at FY21 levels as we await further information on federal relief that may be available to the city and state. Thank you for your support for New York City Parks and the cultural community. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Alexandra Unthank, followed by Scott Daly. Time begins. Hello, um, uh, dear Chair Peter Ku and members of the Committee on Parks and Recreation, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Alex Unthank, the Education Associate of the Lewis Latimer House Museum. And I'm reading this testimony for our education director, I mean, sorry, for the executive director, Ran Yan, who can't be here today. Designated a landmark and sitting on the Department of Parks and Recreation site, 
The Lewis Latimer House Museum was the home for 26 years of a black inventor who is renowned for his work in the field of electric lighting. Among Latimer's numerous achievements and inventions, the most important discovery was a method for producing carbon filaments made uh, that made the production of light bulbs both practical and affordable for the average household. During the temporary uh, closure due to COVID, our virtual programs have become a growing success and an evident relief to our constituents. However, we face immense challenge to reopening. Um, the historic site's internet access broke down earlier this year, so significant that returning to the office becomes all but impossible under the current condition. We respectfully request assistance from the parks telecommunications team, the historic house trust and the city council to repair and upgrade the internet access on this important historic site. Having functional internet up to modern standard is urgent and critical for us to carry out the essential work in interpreting Latimer's story and educating diverse youths. We ask you to invest in the infrastructure of this African-American heritage site owned by Parks so that Lewis Latimer's untold story is no longer overlooked. Um, our board and staff look forward to working with all of you to ensure that this landmarked home is well-maintained and accessible and that his legacy is properly celebrated by the New York City public. Thank you for all of your work and support. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Scott Daly, who will be followed by Stacy Pappas. Time begins. Good afternoon, everybody. Chair Ku, members of the committee. My name is Scott Daly, and I am the Senior Director of the New York Junior Tennis and Learning, NYJTL, free community tennis programs throughout the city. We are funded by the council under a separate initiative and by individual members. I'm here testifying at the parks because without our relationship and partnership with the city parks, we wouldn't have any access to tennis for kids since COVID struck. As I look back on my notes, it seems that I seem to recall it was almost exactly a year ago today. I think it was Friday the 13th. When I was last before this committee speaking down at City Hall on this topic. Um, right now, generally speaking, if it wasn't a COVID year, we would reach 85,000 New York City kids between the ages of five and 18 years of age. It is a totally free program, and it's only because of the assistance we get and the funding we get from the city council. Right now, this tennis program is basically broken down. You see the testimony that's going to be submitted. It breaks down evenly across the board demographics. 25% are African-American, 25% are Asian, 25% are, are Latino. This past year, just let me tell you, we were able to get permits and go out and bring tennis to kids who have to get outside. The, the, the registration numbers are through the roof that these kids want to get out. In the fall, we were at nine locations. They got permits. And the only places we could go were city parks. The city parks worked with us. Right now, we have 11 programs that are going to be starting at the end of April next year, at the end of April of this coming year. Again, city parks is giving us access. And I can't thank the parks enough. It can't be done without the, the help and the support of the city council. City council right now, we have our asking for $1.2 million. We need at, at least to hold what we got last year under the initiative. We have separate protocols, safety procedures in place, PPEs, extra staff members. The numbers, we are maxing out at all our sites. I just want to say in conclusion, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are providing a service and we wouldn't be able to do it without your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stacy Pappas, followed by Carol, Caroline Parker. Time begins. Hello, my name is Stacy Pappas. I'm an East Harlem resident and executive director of Friends of the East River Esplanade. Thank you, Commissioner Silver, for your many years of support of the Esplanade. We're sorry to see you go and we wish you well. Our mission is to advocate for the restoration and reinvention of the Esplanade from 60th to 120th streets, including Pier 107. 
We're grateful to Mayor de Blasio for allocating $75 million in 2019 and an additional $284 million this year to repair the Esplanade. And thank you, Commissioner Silver, for confirming that earlier. I'm here today requesting that the $284 million are approved for the fiscal year 22 budget and that design work begins immediately using the previously allocated 75 million. Since preliminary design work has begun on the adjacent Harlem Greenway link at 125th Street, it would be logical to extend that project south, especially because the Esplanade is barricaded from 117 to 114. This area is now legally defined as an environmental justice area according to local laws 60 and 64, so we can assume the repair of the Esplanade in East Harlem is a top priority for the current administration and future. Conditions on the Esplanade are in a constant state of depreciation. The longer repair work is postponed, the more extensive and expensive the project is going to get. My testimony today is in support of fast tracking the $284 million budget allocation into the fiscal year 22 budget and pursuing a design build model of construction so that the project can move quickly. East Harlem residents deserve to have as safe, accessible, and beautiful a waterfront as much as our neighbors on the west side of Manhattan. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Next is Caroline, Caroline Parker, followed by Kimberly, Kimberly Mayer. Time begins. Good afternoon, my name is Caroline Parker and I'm a legal intern in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, which fights for the equitable distribution of environmental benefits and burdens in our city. I'm here to urge you to ensure that our city's treasured community composting organizations, which embody the principles of environmental justice, receive the financial support they need to operate with dignity and stability throughout the park system. As New York City faces down the existential threat of climate change, organics recycling is a critically important pillar of the city's emissions reduction policy. Composting has repeatedly been highlighted in the city's climate and emissions targets, including the mayor's zero waste goal and the updated one NYC framework. These policy commitments led to an expansion of multiple composting initiatives, including the NYC compost projects currently operating throughout the city's parks, which bring together local residents and students, urban farmers and grassroots sustainability organizations in collective projects to reduce emissions, protect local soil health and support food security. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic and subsequent budget cuts have derailed the city's composting goals. Today, the community-based operations cited on parks land are the only elements of the city's nascent composting system that are still operating. These organizations, which are primarily funded by volunteers, provide a critical service to the entire city with no compensation and minimal financial support. With this year's budget, you have an opportunity to build on this foundation towards a more comprehensive and equitable composting program on par with cities like San Francisco and Seattle. As a steward of more than 30,000 acres of public land, the Parks Department is a critical partner in this goal. We know that DPR shares our desire to ensure a resilient park system that serves the recreational needs of all New Yorkers. And we believe that community scale composting, which brings neighbors together in the name of stewardship and sustainability is fully aligned with that vision. The department has on multiple occasions proclaimed its support for composting. And we hope that this year's budget will reflect this commitment with tangible support for the grassroots projects that are already thriving throughout the park system. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kimberly Mayer or Meyer, followed by Nilka Martell. Time begins. Good afternoon. I'm Kimberly Mayer. I'm the executive director of the Old Stone House in Brooklyn. Uh, thank you, Chair Ku and members of the Parks Committee for your uh, time and your attention and your support for our programming. I'm delivering this testimony on behalf of my colleague sites in the Historic House Trust Network, uh, the Bartow Pell Mansion Museum in the Bronx, the Hendrick Lott House, Old Stone House and Wyckoff House Museum in Brooklyn, Merchants House Museum, Morris Jumel Mansion Museum in Manhattan, uh, the Bound House, King Manor Museum, Kingsland Homestead, Lewis Latimer House Museum, and Queens County Farm Museum in Queens, and the Alice Austin House and Historic Richmond Town on Staten Island. In our testimony at the November 18th, 2020 Parks Committee hearing on the state of historic houses under the jurisdiction of the Parks Committee, we highlighted some of the funding issues our private nonprofits, which operate these historic sites in New York City parks face. Today, we'd like to expand on those issues. 
Our mission critical work is not possible without ensuring the stability and maintenance of the historic structures that house our nonprofits. As Council Member Holden recognized earlier today, members of the public and elected officials have frequently expressed concern about the building conditions of our historic sites and have commented on the lack of attention that the structures receive from the city and the parks department. Currently, between 23 historic sites in the Historic House Trust Network, there is over 50 million in capital funding allocated to these sites for unbuilt projects, some of which have been pending for two decades. Further exacerbating the condition of these structures. Uh, however, in the preliminary mayor's management report discussing DPR's 10 year capital strategy, only 14.2 million is allocated to the capital needs for historic houses, the lowest of all identified facilities. In comparison, recreation and nature centers are listed at 614 million, which is 43 times the figure identified for historic houses. Our sites are assets that necessitate regular preventative maintenance plans. Historic structures demand a different approach to the capital process than other DPR facilities, like playgrounds and recreation centers. And completing these much needed projects in a streamlined and efficient manner is critical for our sites to provide services for all New Yorkers. Although we operate within city parks, our buildings are historic landmark buildings deeply embedded in the cultural sector. As cultural organizations, we frequently receive private funds to administer capital interior renovation projects, all of which have to be run through the Parks Department, where frequent delays deplete the buying power of monies raised and allow these nationally significant sites to fall into states of repair, of disrepair. Compounding these problems, the drawn out process uh, and timeline results of the trust and accountability with our funders and communities. Maintaining these relationships is essential to our operations that we receive only a modest percentage of operating funds through government channels. We thank the City Council for the continued support of our work and are happy to answer any questions that you might have and uh, we're happy to serve our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Nilka Martell, followed by Robert Price. Time begins. Good afternoon. My name is Nilka Martell, and I am the vice chair of the Bronx River Alliance. I am also a lifelong Bronxite, the founder and director of Loving the Bronx, president of the Friends of Pelham Bay Park, and an enthusiastic champion of all Bronx parks. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today about the proposed fiscal year 22 budget and the importance of restoring full funding to our vital parks. I want to specifically thank City Council Member Salamanca and Speaker Johnson for their generous and dedicated support for the Bronx River over the years. The Bronx River Alliance is a not-for-profit formed by community activists and government partners in 2001 to protect, improve, and restore the Bronx River Corridor and Greenway so that it can be a healthy resource for the communities through which they flow. We work in close partnership with New York City Parks and dozens of community-based organizations. We are achieving what many thought was impossible, the creation of beautiful waterfront parks, the restoration of forests and salt marshes, and even the return of a beaver. Perhaps most importantly, we have transformed what was once an abandoned dumping ground into a cherished community asset. I am here today to call for the restoration of fiscal year 20 funding levels to New York City parks. In 2020, our parks demonstrated how essential they are to our city. They were one of the few places that remained open during the darkest days of the pandemic. And yet New York City parks sustained a devastating budget cut, the second largest of any city agency. We all saw the impact of inadequate funding for our parks last year. They were full of garbage, dumping and graffiti increased, enforcement and security couldn't keep up. Our parks suffered and our New York City residents suffered. Today, the Bronx River Alliance, Loving the Bronx and the Friends of Pelham Bay Park stand with all of those who are calling for the city to play fair and fully reinstate funds that were cut from the parks budget in 2020. Specifically, we ask you to reinstate fiscal year 20 levels for seasonal hires, eliminate the, free, the hiring freeze, which has left to key leadership positions empty for over a year, restore full funding for the Parks Equity Initiative, which has funded hands-on environmental education for young people along the Bronx River Corridor, restore $4 million in funding for the Forest Management Framework for New York City, 
to protect our natural areas, including those on the Bronx River. Thank you again for your leadership and for the opportunity to express the Bronx River Alliance's support for increased investment in New York City parks. Thank you. Next up is Robert Price. And begins. Hey, thank you everyone. I'm Rob Price and I learned about this from Garden Train. And I really appreciate everyone's comments before mine and hearing the thoughtful, uh, just to the extent of how much the budget has really affected the parks. Um, New York City parks really saved me this last year. I lost my job. My kids um, lost their in-person schooling and our small Brooklyn apartment, like so many other New Yorkers, became our 24 seven confine. The New York City parks was a place where I'd take the kids to get exercise. Um, my six and eight year olds had a lot of energy and it really wasn't fitting into our apartment very well. So we would go on bike rides to explore new parks. We would go to our park. Uh, I would go there to meditate and exercise. And what I learned is that we really created a habit of going to the park and going to the parks and enjoying that. And like so many other millions of New Yorkers, that habitual nature of going to the park and enjoying it much more that's happened over the last year because of all the things that have been closed down is becoming the new reality. And so as we go into these coming years, everyone's going to be so used to being in the parks, the community networking, the, you know, expecting the safe and clean um, accessibility that we really have expected out of New York City parks and we'll go there and continue to go there for. And um, on a personal note, when you have two kids and you're playing in the park for hours, and you drink a lot of water, they need to go to the bathroom pretty frequently. And there wasn't a lot of open bathrooms. So I think that really comes down to the budgeting. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anthony Font, who will be followed by Wendy Page. Time begins. Hello, everyone. My name is is Anthony Font, can you hear me? Hello? We hear you. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I uh, represent the prideful and upstanding homeowners of Brinkerhoff Avenue in St. Albans, as well as the prideful and upstanding home homeowners of Fonda Avenue in St. Albans. I'm also a member of the St. Albans Alpha Streets Block Association. My parents purchased a home on Brinkerhoff Avenue in St. Albans in 1955. In fact, it was directly behind the Elmira Avenue home of our former Secretary of State and Chair of the Joint Chiefs, Colin Powell. My dear mother, Mrs. Gwendolyn Font passed in 2016, and my dad, Joseph Font Jr., who's 90, still resides at the house. Until several years ago, all four landscape traffic islands on Brinkerhoff Avenue were maintained by the Parks, Parks Department, but by the Parks Department. For all of my life, Parks Department personnel, vehicles, and equipment provided substandard care to these four traffic islands with the exception of the satisfactory upkeep they received during Mayor Dinkins' administration and the meticulous servicing they got during the quality of life emphasis in Giuliani's first term. Parks even posted Green Street signage bearing its LEAF logo on the islands on, in roughly the late 80s, early 90s. About three years ago, Parks began to claim that it was and had been cutting the block's three rectangular, rectangular islands 
which lie between Liberty Avenue and Hannibal Street as a courtesy to the DOT. At that I'm, time, I'm, it reportedly I'm, said that it only had jurisdiction over the triangular island that sits between Hannibal Street and Mayville Street. The Parks Department currently claims <clears throat> The, car, the Parks Department currently claims that it only maintains the triangle as a courtesy now. I have been Please finish out. I have been literally calling for decent upkeep and have physically have been physically providing care for the island since the late 70s. For example, calls to parks offices for service, complaints waged to the borough president's office. 311 complaints for overgrown grass and weeds, as well as illegal dumping and parking. Complaints brought to current Councilman Denise Miller's office, as well as those of his predecessors, Comrie and Spigner. Personally mowing and trimming, the along with other residents during the late 70s and 80s, as well as personally planting and nurturing trees on them, continuing to rid them of litter during that time and on an ongoing basis up until the present, respectively. Therefore, the homeowners of Brinkerhoff and Fonda Avenue require new, excuse me. Please finish up. I'm right. Therefore, the homeowners of Brinkerhoff and Fonda Avenue re require new and substantial curbing. Never in the 66 years that my property tax paying family and other longtime homeowners homeowners have been residing there, has any curbing maintenance or curbing restoration been performed? The Fonda Avenue sides curbing is non-existent. The terrain is level with the road. On the Brinkerhoff Avenue and Mayville Street perimeters, only remnants of the curbing remain. This condition has caused soil erosion. The land soil needs replenishment and grass seeding. We also call for the plentiful planting of trees on the island's barren areas, preferably blue spruce and pine. And finally, regular maintenance of all four islands, mowing, tractor service, the trimming of all areas surrounding trees and bushes is adamantly called for at least every fortnight or three weeks from spring to fall. I and many of my fellow St. Albans property owners thank Chairman Koo and all of the committee for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Our next and last registered speaker is Wendy Page. And begins. It appears that Miss Page is no longer oh, registered. Is she? I'm here. Oh, oh, you are. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Ku, Council members, and members of the Parks Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present my testimony requesting much-needed funding for New York City Parks. My name is Wendy Page. And I'm here today representing the United Athletic Association, a not-for-profit advocacy group representing some 16 sports organizations throughout New York City. We are also members of the New Yorkers for Parks Playfair Coalition and help to get previous budgets increased for parks. UAA is asking for a full restoration of funding for New York City Park staffing. Last year, New York City Parks had a reduction in maintenance and operations seasonal staff, causing a significant decrease in work hours and maintenance visits to parks and athletic fields. We are seeing AstroTurf fields that were resurfaced with new turf already in need of repair. If this continues and no maintenance programs are put in place, compounded by the lack of rules, regulations, and guidelines, these fields will continue to become unsafe and unplayable. These fields will need to be reconstructed again within the next 12 months, costing the taxpayers and the city hundreds of thousands of dollars, which we do not have at present. If parks current rules and regulations are properly followed, 
fields are properly assigned and maintained, reconstructed fields can and will exceed its life expectancy, remaining safe and usable throughout while preserving the integrity of these fields for the rest next 10 plus years. We continue to support the tremendous investment this body and the city has and continues to make in our parks and athletic fields. The appropriate investment and funding would enable proper field maintenance be given the importance and priority it deserves. In closing, we agree with Council Member Holden. We need an independent investigation. The investigation is not just to find out what we already know, but what we don't know. We need to know that those making decisions are adhering to the very same laws that the council enacted and expect the rest of us to follow. It's our right to know that the city and its agencies are playing by the rules put in place to protect us from abuse of power, lack of transparency and accountability. And that really is what the investigation would need to be about. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you Thank very you. much. And we have one last uh, speaker who's calling in. Uh, I believe it's Roxanne Delgado. Time begins. I believe we're just trying to get her connected. Just please bear with us for a second or two. Hello, Ms. Delgado, are you able to, are you able to speak? Or hear us? Please bear with us another minute, thank you. Hello? I'm sorry, hello? Yes, we hear you. Hello? Yes. Hi, yes. I think I heard my name, Roxanne Delgado. Yes, yes. You're, yes. Oh, hi. Thank you. Please begin. I'm thank sorry. You. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually outside working, but uh, thank you. My name is Roxanne Delgado. I'm the founder of Friends of Holland Parkway. Earlier this, today, I sent a lot of photos of uh, depicting on what we go through frequently in Pelham Parkway in the Bronx and other parts of the green spaces in our uh, in, in the Bronx. First, the first photo show all the trees that were uh, damaged by the park's front mower, which is unfortunately because I don't know what they do. Every time they come to mow the grass, they damage trees. And there is a severe damage and trauma on these trees, and no one from Forestry bothered to, to check on these trees. They're just left in their damage and, and left to, uh, to survive on their own if they do survive. Then I saw a lot of, I see lots of pictures of trash bags. Some of the corners had over 20 trash bags, which I, I myself picked up and emptied out myself and left it for parks to pick up after 10 days, 15 days. And parks tells me, well, no one told you to pick it up. I said, but we cannot leave it overfilled because then it flows onto the ground and, and it kind of deters people from being 
more mindful of uh, loving their parks instead of uh, tossing trash and littering. But when you see trash can overfill, then people just throw trash on the ground instead of using the trash bin. And because I complained, some of, they removed my trash can, so I went elsewhere to get more trash cans. And then, um, unfortunately, parks does not do more with less. They do less with less. And unfortunately, Palm Parkway is a parkway, not a, full, not, not, not a playground. So we're not giving priority like playgrounds are. And, and talk about um, justice, uh, environmental justice, a lot of the resources that we allocated to other bigger parks or playgrounds and Palm Parkway and other green spaces, including um, uh, street trees and, and green streets, are left to their own accord. And therefore, as last year, from June to late October, we did weekly cleanups. The mind you, are not a nonprofit, are no collect donations, are not making any money out of this, but I did it because our park was left to, to its own accord and let it die and let it be neglected. And I said, we're not going to allow this parkway to deteriorate because we spent three years of our, our heart and sweat to keep this park clean, and now the park department walks away from it. And unfortunately, we have a park manager, Matthew Dorian, who doesn't seem to have any um, any community mindfulness towards the residents or the volunteers who seem to just want to put rosy reports to, to elevate himself in the corporate ladder and parks agency. And he, he, gives, he, makes them, he says what they want to hear, that everything's fine and dandy. And it's not. And talking about, I want, we need more funding, but you have to look into oversight because when they do receive funding, it never reaches to certain parts of the Bronx. It, we're left, to, we're left to, to care for our own park through maintenance and emptying out trash cans. And unfortunately, just recently, about seven weeks ago, I actually picked up a needle and I pricked myself. So I had to get tested and I have to get retested in two weeks again. So I shouldn't have to go through this because uh, the agency doesn't um, care for the parkway. The manager uh, decides to neglect the parkway and focus on bigger parks because maybe um, to elevate, elevate himself in the corporate ladder, Matthew Dorian. You know, we've been going through a lot because last year we were told we could not help whole clean up the more than 20 volunteers, but yeah, we have big, big parties with over 45 people with face with no face masks, drinking, barbecuing, and, and park enforcement park enforcement didn't do anything. Meanwhile, I'm giving uh, directions. I'm not how, not allowed to hold clean up for more than 15 people. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't make sense how parks is actually uh, hindering the progress we made as volunteers and and residents because we get over 35 volunteers sometimes in our cleanup. And we don't even we're not even a nonprofit. We don't have any money, but people are doing it because we help through outreach for people to to appreciate the beauty of of nature and of trees. And but unfortunately, we have a lot of environmental injustice in our area because of the park manager. Just recently, he did a tree planting plan where he's planting trees everywhere but where we are because we, where we're located is NYCHA. But he's park he's planting the trees near the homeowners, near Jacoby Hospital, but not where NYCHA is. It exists because, and I happen to live right next to NYCHA, so this impacts me directly with no public input, which is environmental injustice because environmental just means that the community can participate hey, in the system making. Wrap of up. I'm sorry, what? I said, I said, please wrap up. Okay, I'll, I'll end up with two sentences. All right, thank you're, you. Uh, you're over time that that okay, so my last sentence is environmental justice is when the city agencies refuses to. Uh, give opportunity to the community to have impact on decisions that uh, impact them directly. So thank you for your time and enjoy you. Have a good weekend. Okay, thank you for your for your suggestions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe that was our last speaker for this hearing. So I will turn it back to Chair Ku to offer some closing remarks and to adjourn this hearing. Thank you, Chris. You did done a good job. Yeah. Thank you to the Parks Department and their staff and everyone who took the time to speak today. It's clear from today's testimony that parks have really become our everything and that investing in our parks is an investment in our residents and our city's recovery. I look forward to continuing to work with everyone to ensure that the city's public parks and robust parks programming have the funding they need in this budget and all the future budgets. Thank you again to Monica, Monica, 
Chima, Chris, Patrick, Stephanie Rules, and the entire finance division. Uh, and, and also, of, of course, I want to thank my own staff for all their hard work on this hearing. And with that, 